freezing up here. It is always cold. It's ridiculous. Okay. Good morning. Welcome to the June 2017 open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. Madam Secretary, would you please introduce our agenda this morning? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and good morning, Commissioners. For today's meeting, you will hear seven items for your consideration. First, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking that would amend the Commission's Emergency Alert System, or EAS, rules to add a dedicated event code, BLU, for blue alerts so that EAS alerts can deliver actionable information to the public when a law enforcement officer is killed, seriously injured, missing in connection with his or her official duties, or if there is an imminent and credible threat to a law enforcement officer. Second, you will consider a report and order that establishes the procedures and standards the Commission will use to review alternative plans submitted by states seeking to opt out of the first net network and to build their own radio access networks that are interoperable with first net. Third, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking that would amend the caller ID rules to allow disclosure of blocked caller ID information to aid law enforcement in investigating threatening calls and continue the waiver of those rules that is currently in effect for Jewish community centers. Fourth, you will consider an order and declaratory ruling that recommends granting OneWeb's request to be permitted to access the U.S. market using its proposed global non-geostationary satellite constellation for the provision of broadband communication services in the United States. Fifth, you will consider a notice of inquiry that seeks comment on ways to facilitate greater consumer choice and enhance broadband deployment in multiple tenant environments, such as apartment buildings, condominium buildings, shopping malls, or cooperatives. The notice of inquiry further seeks comment on the current state of broadband competition in such locations and whether additional commission action in this area is warranted to eliminate or reduce barriers faced by broadband providers that seek to serve the occupants of multiple tenant environments. Six, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking in order that, one, proposes to eliminate the requirement that carriers that complete payphone calls conduct an annual audit of their payphone call tracking systems and file an associated annual audit report with the Commission, and two, waives upcoming annual audit and associated reporting, reporting requirements. Seventh, you will consider an enforcement action. This is your agenda for today. Please note item six listed in the Commission's June 2017 Sunshine Notice has been adopted by the Commission and deleted from today's agenda. The first item today will be presented by the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, and Lisa Folks, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And before I turn the floor over to Chief Folks and to, to our distinguished staff from the Public Safety Bureau as well as the Justice Department, I just wanted to make a brief uh, statement about why uh, it is important, I think, that we are laboring in the field of public safety today. Uh, I, along with uh, millions of Americans, I think, was shocked by the events last week in which uh, Congressman Steve Scalise, among others, uh, was uh, attacked at a baseball field in Alexandria, Virginia. I've had the privilege of getting to know Congressman Scalise over the years, uh, was uh, once living in uh, near his district in Louisiana, and uh, one of the first uh, things uh, that he sent me when I became a commissioner was a much appreciated bag of community coffee. And uh, he and I have had a, a great relationship ever since about coffee policy and lanyap, as he might say, down in Louisiana. I certainly uh, wish him well. I was horrified to hear of what had happened. I uh, hope that he is on the mend soon. And uh, certainly my thoughts and prayers are with him, uh, with his family, with his friends, uh, both personal and in Congress, of which there are many. And I certainly hope uh, that uh, he uh, gets better soon. I also want to recognize the heroic efforts of the security officers who were there that day. But for the fact that those uniformed officers were on the firing line, quite literally, it is, uh, it's hard to conceive how bad the carnage could have been. And so I want to express my appreciation to all of them uh, who did such a superb job keeping folks safe, obstructing and ultimately incapacitating the shooter, and otherwise uh, acquitting uh, the men and women in blue very well with their efforts. I don't know if my colleagues would like to say a word, but uh, turn the floor over to them. Yesterday, when it comes to this, 
uh, item or comes to this issue, I had a chance to smile because I um, saw, like many of you, even though I didn't attend in person, Crystal uh, Griner, or Griner um, throw out that pitch. Might have taken her more than one time, but she did it. Yeah. Um, I was there in person, no preference, just timing and, and, and the like, because the chairman has like 10,000 items that I had to read. <laughs> um, but I, I did see in person where uh, uh, David uh, Bailey um, threw out uh, that pitch. And I mentioned those two, along with Zach Barth, uh, Matt Mi Micah, as well as our friend, fellow Southerner, uh, Representative Steve Galise, Scalise, because that pitch, those pitches, represented, you know, to me, the improvement and the hope uh, that we are all embracing. He went last time from being grave <laughs> to now fair in a short period of time. Um, so we are so happy. I proclaimed uh, that day to be a member of Team Scalise. I, uh, I maintain uh, that membership. And um, I, he, his family continues to be out in our thoughts and prayers. I am so grateful to the Capitol Police. Always like them. Truly love them. And um, uh, again, uh, Godspeed. And uh, they have proven once again why, just like you said, this meeting is so important. And to be able to give them the tools they need uh, to uh, complete their duties is, is job one for the FCC. Amen to that, Commissioner. No, I, I appreciate the, the opportunity to, to weigh in on, on a, such an important topic, and I, I thank the chairman for raising it. I, too, want to wish the best to recovery to Congressman Scalise. I, too, have spent some time with him and his staff and been a wonderful experience. Uh, I, I have ta had an opportunity to talk to a number of congressmen this week. They say that they've visited with him and he is on the men's. It sounds like it's going to be a, a pretty long recovery. Um, I don't know if he was a marathon runner before, but I think he's, he's going to have some challenges moving forward, so we wish him the best. Uh, certainly, my, my support to the Capitol Police. They have uh, been there on many a time in my past life, uh, and to see them step in again is not a surprise at all. And then the staffers that were, were part of this, you know, as a former staffer, sometimes we we uh, blend into the background um, and, and hear that they've, they're facing ch challenges and lobbyists, it's part of the challenge in, in recovery as well. So I wish everyone the best. I think one of the moments that that's most, so that the the Commissioner Clyburn references that we're all on the same team here, that we may have differences in opinion on different things, but we are all trying to do the best we can. And uh, I, I know there was a, you know, there was, uh, there's been this effort to to um, watch our rhetoric, and I think uh, I'm certainly cognizant of that. There's someone referenced me as an, as an ideologue this week, and I thought I'd just, you know, kind of move on and just be a uh, better person for it. And so I think that's uh, I, one of the good things that came from this moment. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner. I agree with your sentiments. And uh, with that, uh, Chief Folks, the floor is yours. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Clyburn, Commissioner O'Reilly. Before we present the item, I would like to introduce a special guest from the Department of Justice, National Blue Alert Deputy Coordinator Vincent Davenport from the DOJ's Office of Community Oriented Policing Services, or COPS Office, who will offer some background on blue alerts. I will now turn it over to Mr. Davenport. Thank you very much, Lisa. And good morning, Commissioner Pye, Chairman Pye, Commissioner Clyburn, and Commissioner O'Reilly. And thank you very much for your opening sentiments. Much appreciated. And thank you for this opportunity to speak on, the, on behalf of the Department of Justice. The protection and support of law enforcement is a top priority for the United States Department of Justice. The issue before you today represents a significant step forward in our nation's commitment to protecting the lives of officers who bravely serve in communities large and small. The dangers of police work have always been known and accepted by those who serve, but few could have imagined the vicious and often premeditated attacks on officers which occur far too often. These attacks on law enforcement contribute to an erosion of public safety, which is a hallmark of free societies. The Rafael Ramos and Wenjian Liu Blue Alert Act calls for the creation of a communications network to ensure that key information about threats to law enforcement is disseminated to the public and to law enforcement in a timely manner. The Office of Community-Oriented Policing is honored to implement the National Blue Alert Network, which provides resources and technical assistance to states, 
law enforcement agencies, and others seeking to establish or enhance Blue Alert plans. Our work is made possible by the support of many, including the Fraternal Order of Police, the National Association of Police Organizations, the National Sheriff's Association, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and all, all of whom are represented in our National Blue Alert Advisory Group. The Federal Communications Commission is uniquely positioned to provide special support. We have asked the FCC to issue a dedicated emergency alert event code for Blue Alerts. Such a code would dramatically improve the effectiveness of the National Blue Alert Network and facilitate the integration of Blue Alert plans nationwide. But most important, a Blue Alert event code would help save lives. It has been a pleasure working with your staff in the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, a truly dedicated team of public servants. We wish also to acknowledge and thank broadcasters, wireless carriers, and others who play a vital role in keeping Americans safe through their support of wireless of emergency alerts. Today is an important first step in our request. Moving forward, we pledge our full support and we stand ready to assist the FCC in every way that we can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Davenport, for your service and for being here today. The Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau is pleased to present a notice of proposed rulemaking that would enable states to use the emergency alert system to issue blue alerts, that is, specific alerts designed to protect law enforcement officers as they perform their vital public safety mission. This item promotes the important national policy as articulated by the President in a recent executive order of preventing violence against law enforcement officers. Consistent with this public policy and in furtherance of the Rafael Ramos and Wenjian and Liu National Blue Alert Act of 2015. This item facilitates the development of compatible and integrated Blue Alert plans throughout the United States. As the granddaughter of a retired detective in the Philadelphia Police Department, this item has particular significance for me. Blue Alerts can not only give us the opportunity to help protect ourselves and our own communities, but also those brave men and women who risk their own lives to protect us. I would like to introduce the members of my team from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau who are seated with me today. Nikki McGinnis, Acting Deputy Bureau Chief, Gregory Cook, Deputy Chief of the Bureau's Policy and Licensing Division, and Peter Schroyer, an Attorney Advisor in the Bureau's Cybersecurity and Communications Reliability Division. Mr. Schroyer will present the item. Thank you, Bureau Chief folks and Deputy Coordinator Davenport. Good morning, Chairman Pine and Commissioners. Today's notice of proposed rulemaking proposes to add a new Blue Alert Code, BLU, to the current list of authorized codes in the Emergency Alert System, or EAS. This code would provide the public with actionable information about the incapacitation of or imminent threat to law enforcement officers. In order to send an alert through the EAS and therefore warn the public through television and radio, authorities must select from a list of established event codes. For example, CAE, which stands for Child Abduction Emergency, is used to send AMBER alerts. Similar to AMBER alerts, a blue alert could allow the public to play a critical role in protecting law enforcement. <clears throat> Under today's proposal, a blue alert could be issued whenever one of three criteria is met. First, a law enforcement officer is killed or seriously injured. Second, there is an imminent and credible threat to cause death or serious injury to a law enforcement officer. And third, a law enforcement officer is missing in the line of duty and there is an indication of the officer's serious injury or death. In any of these scenarios, the suspect must still be at large and there must be sufficient descriptive information of the suspect for the information to be actionable by the public. As with weather and amber alerts, it would be voluntary for state and local officials to send blue alerts and voluntary for broadcasters and other EAS participants to carry blue alerts. <clears throat> In addition with this proposal, the item seeks comment on whether the EAS is an effective means of delivering blue alerts and if so, whether a dedicated Blue Alert EAS event code would facilitate the implementation of Blue Alerts in a compatible and uniform manner nationwide. Alternately, the notice asks whether existing EAS codes are sufficient to convey Blue Alert information. Additionally, the item seeks comment on whether, and if so, how, adopting a Blue Alert EAS event code would impact the wireless emergency alert system, which transmits alerts to wireless phones, and whether a dedicated event code would increase public recognition of Blue Alerts. 
Lastly, the item seeks comment on the cost and benefits of adding the Blue Alert Code and appropriate implementation time frame for adding the Blue Alert Code. The Bureau recommends adoption of the item and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schroyer. And with that, we'll turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner Clyburn. Just last month, I had the distinct privilege of spending some time with the dedicated call takers and radio dispatchers of the Los Angeles Communications Center, the largest highway patrol dispatch center in the state of California. These mission critical men and women handle almost 2 million 911 calls each year, sending help our way when we are in distress and offering hope when we need it the most. That dispatcher is the responding police officer's lifeline, providing suspect description, coordinating resources, and sending backup when necessary. There are times, however, when a dispatcher is performing these functions without access to critical information that could help save an officer's life and the lives of innocent bystanders. Information such as the retaliatory threat on Instagram, which was later acted upon by the man who killed two New York City police officers on December 20th of 2014. Those officers, Rafael Ramos and Wenjian Liu, are now painful symbols of the National Blue Alert Act, which was signed into law two years ago by former President Obama. Today, the Commission commences a proceeding to realize the Blue Alert Act's goals of promoting compatible and integrated Blue Alert plans throughout the United States. In particular, we propose to revise the Commission's emergency alert system rules to add a Blue Alert event code, which would be used in situations involving the serious injury or death of a law enforcement officer in the line of duty, an officer who is missing in connection with his or her official duties, or an imminent and credible threat that an individual intends to cause injury to or kill a law enforcement officer. We seek comment on this proposal, as well as a number of additional issues, including whether the current system could accommodate blue alerts as effectively as other types of alerts, how the public may respond to blue alert EAS codes, and what effect our proposal would have on wireless emergency alerts. During life-threatening and dangerous situations, our nation's law enforcement officers put their lives on the line. We appreciate those who have taken the oath to serve and protect our communities and understand that the job they perform each and every day is not an easy one. These brave men and women are asked to make rapid, life-altering decisions that can determine whether or not they get home to their families at the end of the day. We owe it to those officers who take and abide by that sacred oath to protect and serve, to uphold our public safety obligation of ensuring that those essential lines of communications operate in a uniform and consistent manner to the newly appointed Chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Lisa Folks, and the Bureau's hard-working staff, you have my sincere thanks for your continued efforts to enhance emergency communications. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Devon, for, for being here. I apologize. I didn't know you were coming, or we would have probably demossed the area so, during your presentation. No <laughs> It is without question that the contributions made by America's law enforcement officials are now inval invaluable. We are reminded time and time again that they come to our aid without hesitation, regardless of the dangers of their personal well-being when things look the bleakest. Today we consider a notice that may, if implemented, help us make law enforcement personnel safer. While some localities have used other codes for such purposes, it is helpful exercise to understand whether a new code is needed and the potential benefits of a nationwide code. Ultimately, when, where, and how to use this code will be up to the discretion of the local law enforcement agencies. They will have to make the ultimate judgment call about whether releasing such information is likely to facilitate their efforts. To the extent that America's law enforcement officials find this helpful, I'm supportive and look forward to engaging with them on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner O'Reilly. In 2014, as Commissioner Clyburn pointed out, uh, just five days before Christmas, 
Officers Rafael Ramos and Wenjin Liu of the New York City Police Department were shot at point-blank range in Brooklyn. The gunman emptied several rounds into the officers' heads and torsos while they were conducting a stakeout from their patrol car. Officers Ramos and Liu never had a chance. In fact, authorities said they never even drew their weapons. Officer Ramos had just turned 40 earlier that week, and Officer Liu had been married for just two months. Now, these men in blue were two of our nation's finest, needless to say. The most frustrating part of the story is that it could have ended differently. Uh, we now know that earlier in the day, the gunman shot his girlfriend in Baltimore and then posted on Instagram that he was heading to New York City to attack police officers. After seeing the warning signs on Instagram, uh, the Baltimore Police Department informed a precinct in Brooklyn that the gunman was, quote, pinging in that location. But that information couldn't be relayed through the NYPD in time to save the officers. And we'll never know if, uh, for sure, of course, but Officers Ramos and Liu may have had a better chance of surviving had a blue alert been issued over the Emergency Alert System, or EAS. A blue alert, as Mr. Schroer pointed out, is similar to the amber alerts that we use to find and recover missing children. With a blue alert, state and local authorities can send warnings over broadcast, cable, satellite, and wireline video networks to quickly warn a community of imminent threats to police. Some 27 states already use blue alerts over EAS to notify the public when there's actionable information relating to a law enforcement officer who is missing, imminently incredibly threatened, or seriously injured or killed in the line of duty. And I, I think, like my colleagues, can't think of a better way to start off Public Safety Month here at the FCC than by considering federal action on blue alerts. This is important because it will help to facilitate and streamline both new and existing blue alert plans into a coordinated national framework uh, across all states. This framework is consistent with the Blue Alert Act, which uh, was enacted to encourage, enhance, and integrate the formation of voluntary blue alert plans throughout the United States. Now, as is obvious, uh, given the witness table, we do not stand alone in this effort. Last month at the U.S. Department of Justice, I had the honor of joining Mr. Davenport, Acting Associate General Jesse Panuccio, and uh, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Director Thomas Homan, as well as several leaders of our nation's public safety community, in announcing the rollout of the National Blue Alert Network. I noted then, and I reiterate today, that with this step, we are not just advancing a policy. We are affirming a principle. And that principle is that we, the American people, have a collective responsibility to protect and serve those who protect and serve us. Today's first step toward establishing a blue alert code is just one example of our commitment to this principle. I want to thank Mr. Davenport of the COPS office and the entire Justice Department for uh, your leadership on this issue and for the presentation this morning. And I want to give special shout-outs to uh, Nicole McGinnis and to James Wiley of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, each of whom uh, received rave reviews uh, when I was at the Justice Department from a variety of folks who have been involved in this effort. It was not easy to get to this point, and that we're here is testament to your efforts. I also want to thank uh, Gregory Cook and Lisa Folks of the Public Safety Bureau, Ms. Peter Schroyer for the great presentation this morning, and David Horowitz and Anjali Singh from the Office of General Counsel for their dedication to keeping Americans safe. And with that, we will move to a vote on the item. Commissioner Clyburn. Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. Uh, the chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thank you, Chief Folks. And uh, with that, Madam Secretary, we can move to the next item on the agenda. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, the second item on your agenda will also be presented by the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. It is entitled Procedures for Commission Review of State Opt-Out Requests from the FirstNet Radio Access Network. Lisa Folks, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. And uh, Chief Folks, whenever you and your team are ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. America's first responders must be able to communicate reliably with one another during emergencies. That is why Congress created the First Responder Network Authority, or FirstNet, to build and operate a nationwide interoperable broadband network for use by public safety officials. FirstNet, which holds a spectrum license from the Commission, is charged with constructing, deploying, and operating the nationwide network. FirstNet recently selected its network partner, AT&T, and is in the process of providing each state with its plans for network deployment within the state. 
Under the statute, a state may accept FirstNet's proposal or a state may elect to opt out of the FirstNet network and instead build its own radio access network, so long as the state demonstrates that this network will be compatible and interoperable with FirstNet's network. Congress tasked the FCC with several discrete but important duties to help bring FirstNet to fruition. One of these duties is to evaluate any state opt-out proposal to determine whether the state's network plan meets the statutory requirements for interoperability with FirstNet and to approve or disapprove the plan accordingly. Today we present a report in order that sets forth the standards and procedures the FCC would use for this review. This order would enable the FCC to faithfully carry out its statutory mission and help promote the success of this vital public safety initiative. With me at the table today from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau are Roberto Mussenden, Attorney Advisor from the Policy and Licensing Division, and Erica Olson, Senior Legal Counsel for the Bureau. I would like to thank the Division and other Bureau staff for their hard work on this order, as well as other bureaus and offices that contributed. Mr. Munson will present the item. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, Chairman Pai, Commissioners. Today's report and order represents the next step for the Commission in fulfilling its statutory role in support of the nationwide interoperable public safety broadband network. As Lisa has indicated, the Commission is responsible under the FirstNet statute for the first line review of state plans to opt out of the FirstNet network and build and support their own radio access network, also known as a RAN. Should a state plan successfully pass commission review, it will then go further review by the National Telecommunications and Information Administration under separate statutory criteria. Today's report and order establishes the procedures for the submission of opt-out state plans to the commission and defines the standards that the Commission will apply in evaluation of such plans. First, the report and order sets out how states that elect to opt out of the FirstNet network will provide notice of their opt-out elections and file alternative plans with the Commission. In accordance with the statutory provision that opt-out elections will be made by each state governor, the report and order establishes the process for the governor or his or her designee to notify the Commission of the governor's opt-out election within 90 days after receiving notice from FirstNet. It also establishes as a statutory threshold matter that a state must have completed its request for proposal within 180 days of that notice to file an alternative plan with the commission, meaning that a state must have issued an RFP, received bids, and made a vendor selection. If this requirement is met, a state will have an additional 60 days to file their plan with the Commission, allowing for a robust and fully realized plan for consideration. The report and order further allows states to request confidentiality for elements of their plans that contain sensitive information and provides a limited pleading cycle for FirstNet and the National Telecommunication and Information Administration to provide comment on the plan as well as for additional impacted parties to participate. In terms of commission review, the report and order provides for a 90-day aspirational shot clock for commission action as a means to provide certainty and urgency to move the process forward. Next, the commission addresses the scope of commission review and the two-pronged tests that the commission must apply. Under that test, the commission must determine if a state alternative plan demonstrates compliance with the recommendation of the Technical Advisory Board for Interoperability previously convened by the Commission pursuant to the Act and demonstrated interoperability with the FirstNet network. The report and order confirms that the Commission's review is limited to the review of the interoperability of the radio access network. Under prong one, the report limits Commission review to the enumerated requirements of the board's report related to radio access network interoperability. Under prong two, the report and order recognizes that FirstNet recently submitted into the record a matrix of technical considerations it asserts are relevant to this determination. The report and order directs the Bureau to issue a public notice seeking expedited comment on FirstNet's proposed matrix, after which the issue will be referred to the Commission for final determination. Finally, 
the report in order recognizes that some parties to the proceeding have raised the issue of whether states can include a separate core in their alternative plans. The report in order finds this issue to be outside of the scope of the Commission's interoperability review as defined by statute. The Bureau recommends adoption of this report in order and requests editorial privileges for technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mustin. I will now turn to comments from the bench. Uh, Commissioner Clyburn. Nearly 16 years ago, we were frozen in disbelief as four coordinated, atta uh, coordinated attacks undermined our nation's sense of security and robbed nearly 3,000 people of their lives. Though we were stunned and are still grieving, among the many actions to follow were recommendations from the 9-11 Commission and the congressional creation of FirstNet, which would establish and oversee a nationwide interoperable broadband network solely dedicated to public safety. Earlier this week, as you heard, FirstNet and AT&T achieved a key milestone by delivering individual plans to the states. In doing so, they initiated the soft start of the official opt-in, opt-out process for states, which will commence once FirstNet and AT&T deliver their final plans to the states in the fall. FirstNet's success depends on there being truly interoperability across this nation, and the decision whether to opt-in or not is a momentous one that no governor or any of us will take lightly. The FCC, NTIA, and the states will embark on a deliberative, deliberate, informed process on, which, on what is best for individual states and this nation. According to press reports, 49 states, states sought follow-up meetings on the very day the plans were delivered, which affirms to me and should provide comfort to you that each party is taking its role seriously. Now to be completely transparent, I fully believe in FirstNet's mission and personally hope that each state will elect to opt in. But Congress ex expressly and rightly afforded each state the ability to opt out of FirstNet, and this option is what we sought to capture in today's order. If some say that opting out is an impossible feat, my answer is that was not Congress's intent. Congress intended to give states a meaningful, if difficult, opportunity to decide if it is in their best interest to submit an alternate plan to the commission. And for any state wishing to opt out, once the plan is submitted, the commission is committed to working diligently to review the submission within the targeted 90-day shot clock time frame, and our technical review of a state's alternate plan will align with our statutory mandate. And that is a promise we intend to keep. On more than one occasion, for those of us who follow us on uh, those of you who follow us on a regular basis, you have witnessed sometimes heated disagreements on this side of the bench. But when it comes to public safety, there is no debate. We will work to do everything in our power to pave the way for the exped expeditious fast <laughs> deployment of truly <laughs> nationwide interoperable interoperable network for our country. First responders put their lives on the line each and every day to keep us safe. They deserve the very best in communications technologies. The American people deserve the very best network. And the FCC will do everything in its power to deliver. My thanks to Lisa Folks and the staff of the Public Safety Homeland Security Bureau for your work on this item of national import and local impact. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012 provided the Commission with very little authority over the inner workings of FirstNet's nationwide interoperable public safety broadband network. While I pushed for, in a different life, the FCC to have a larger, greater role and oversight function, I didn't win that policy argument. Instead, we have the task of administrating the state opt-out process and reviewing any alternative plans submitted for the Radio Access Network, or RAN. Generally, today's order appears consistent with the authority provided to the Commission under the Act and attempts to apply its provisions fairly. 
Hopefully, we struck the right balance, providing states the ability to make an informed choice and first net the certainty needed to proceed. Therefore, I support the order. Besides discussing the substance of the various filings, the item contemplates the time frames in which states need to indicate their intention to opt out and provide their alternative plans. Failure to meet these timelines and submission requirements is quite consequential. States lose the ability to opt out. We hold these parties accountable, and the Commission should similarly be held accountable as well. That's why I'm a little disappointed that the Commission's 90-day shot clock for the review of state alternative plans is just aspirational. The Commission has a histo history with aspirational shot clocks that seem to be stopped and started at will. In fact, they've proven to be as reliable as a sundial on a cloudy day. The item states, however, that the shot clock will only be suspended for special circumstances, such as a national, state, or local emergency that requires diversion of Commission staff resources to address the situation. I expect the Commission to live up to this commitment. Ultimately, the Commission must do what it can to move the process along so this network can finally be built. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner O'Reilly. Uh, today, today, as uh, pointed out, the Commission takes a significant step forward in carrying out its responsibilities to help the First Responder Network Authority, or FirstNet, uh, establish a nationwide interoperable public safety broadband network. And we could not have reached this milestone without the leadership of many in Congress and the efforts of a number of individuals in both the public and private sectors. From the beginning, uh, the FCC has played a collaborative role to help realize Congress's vision. In the past five years alone, the FCC has allocated spectrum for use by a nationwide public safety broadband network. It's granted a spectrum license to FirstNet. It has established a technical advisory board for first responder interoperability. It's approved technical requirements to FirstNet. And now, with this order, we fulfill our latest statutory responsibility. Now, this is all just one part of an ongoing and overarching plan to ensure that when the next disaster strikes, our first responders in the field, our call center dispatchers, our EMTs, our police officers, our firefighters, and others will have the tools that they need to save lives. I'd like to thank David Firth, Bazad Ghaffari, Brian Marenko, Roberto Mussenden, Erica Olson, Rasul Savavian from the Public Safety Bureau and Homeland Security Bureau, and Keith McKirkard and Bill Rich uh, Richardson from the Office of General Counsel for their continued efforts to help our nation's first responders protect the public, and of course, to Chief Folks for shepherding the process through. With that, we will go to a vote on the item. Commissioner Clyburn? Aye. Commissioner O'Reilly? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks very much. And uh, Madam Secretary, if you could now take us to the next item on the agenda. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the third item on your agenda will be presented by the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau and is entitled Rules and Policies Regarding Calling Number Identification Service, Caller ID. And Mark Stone, Deputy Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you. Mr. Stone, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Today, I'm pleased to introduce an item that begins the important process of making it easier for public safety officials and security personnel to respond to threatening calls from blocked phone numbers while maintaining individual privacy protections. In recent years, media and law enforcement reports indicate that the number of threatening calls appears to be increasing dramatically. Telephone threats often come from callers who have blocked their caller ID information in order to conceal their identity. Blocked caller ID hindered investigations of the telephone bomb threats against Jewish community centers earlier this year and school districts and NASA before that. The notice of proposed rulemaking before you seeks to ensure that all threatened parties and associated law enforcement personnel have quicker access to the information they need to thwart callers without regulatory delay. Before turning the presentation over to CGB staff, I would like to thank the other bureaus and offices that helped us, the Office of General Counsel, the Wireline Competition Bureau, and the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. With me at the table are Kurt Schroeder, Chief of CGB's Consumer Policy Division, Nancy Stevenson, Deputy Chief of the Division, and Nellie Fusner, Honors Attorney in the Division. Nellie will present the item. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The notice of proposed rulemaking before you begins the proceeding to amend the Commission's caller ID rules to allow called parties and law enforcement to obtain blocked caller ID information as a way of facilitating their investigation of threatening calls. This would be a narrow exemption from the privacy protections in the current rule, which recognizes that a caller may have a legitimate interest in blocking caller ID. First, the item proposes 
that this exemption be crafted to promote both public safety and privacy interests. It would allow access to blocked caller ID only in the limited case of threatening calls, where the caller does not have a legitimate privacy interest, and would allow access only to authorized personnel for the purpose of investigating threatening calls. The NPRN seeks comment on ways to facilitate the ability of law enforcement and security personnel to investigate and identify threatening callers while protecting the legitimate privacy interests of non-threatening callers. The item proposes to define a threatening call as any call that includes a threat of serious and imminent unlawful action posing a substantial risk to property, life, safety, or health. The item asks how to evaluate whether a threat meets the proposed definition. Specifically, it asks whether block caller ID should only be made available after a law enforcement agency confirms that it meets the threatening call threshold. The NPRM also seeks comment on whether the Commission should require anyone seeking access to blocked caller ID to do so in conjunction with a law enforcement agency. This measure could provide assurance that the called party is not attempting to circumvent the privacy protections by reporting a false threat. In addition, the item asks how to reduce administrative burdens on carriers that must provide the caller ID information while ensuring that the threatened party and law enforcement receive the information in a timely manner. The NPRM also seeks comment on a separate but similar issue facing private ambulance services. The caller ID rules currently allow public emergency services to obtain blocked caller ID so that they can readily respond to callers who request assistance but may have inadvertently blocked the caller ID. The NPRM asks whether to extend this current exemption to private ambulance services facing the same problem. Finally, the item confirms that good cause continues to exist to maintain the temporary emergency waiver granted to the Jewish community centers and the carriers who serve them. The temporary waiver would remain in effect while the Commission considers adopting a more generally applicable exemption for the same purpose. We recommend the adoption of this item and request editorial privileges to make technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fosner. And if I'm not mistaken, this is your first time in the hot seat, so well done. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you. Among the great technological advances in telephone communication service during the second half of the 20th century is caller ID. Thanks to this remarkable feature, in an instant, we know whether that incoming call in the middle of our favorite show is our child's teacher calling about a missing homework assignment or that wonderful but incredibly verbose best friend looking to share with us something we already know. But in some in, yeah. <laughs> but in some instances, <laughs> what we find as we decide whether or not to pick up the phone is that the number is blocked, leaving us guessing who is on the other end. Sometimes there are good reasons for this, say when calls are made from a domestic violence shelter. But other cases can be nefarious, like a scammer trying to remain in the shadows. But when that incoming call is a threat of serious and imminent unlawful action, is of serious and imminent unlawful action, and the number is blocked, it is critical for law enforcement to be able to quickly identify its origin. Their ability to obtain caller ID information can literally be a matter of life or death. Today, we launched a proceeding that would allow threatened parties and law enforcement personnel to have quick access to block caller ID information in the limited instances where a threatening call poses a substantial risk of harm to property, life, safety, or health. In tentatively proposing to amend our rules to allow access in limited circumstances, we recognize the significant privacy interests of consumers and the need for safeguards to protect this information in cases where a threat may have been falsified. Striking a balance between privacy and the interests of law enforcement and public safety has been a topic of great debate in this country for many, many years. At the foundation of our Constitution are rights to free speech and protection against unreasonable search and seizures, and in the age of caller ID, this means making sure that legitimate privacy interests are protected. This is why I am pleased that the NPRM asked for comment on how to determine whether a call is in fact that it meets the definition of a threatening call. And by asking whether restricted caller party 
calling party number information should be limited to law enforcement eyes only, we are headed down a path that I believe will protect the appropriate safeguards. Many thanks are due to the staff of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, including Patrick Wimbry, Mark Stone, Makai Caldwell, Kirk Schroeder, Karen Schroeder, there's a family thing going here, but and Nancy Stevenson, uh, Richard Smith, Nellie Fusner, uh, for their work on this critical item. And Chair Mr. Chairman, if it weren't so cold in here, I might be able to uh, uh, be a little bit more fluid. But um, that's not a hint for somebody to check the uh, thermostat. But somebody needs to check the thermostat. Thank you very much. I vote aye on that. So, uh, Commissioner O'Reilly. The substantial increase in the number of threatening calls to schools, religious organizations, and other entities since 2011 is truly appalling. At the same time, the Commission must be mindful of the valid privacy interest of callers who may choose to block caller ID to protect themselves or others from real harms. The notice before us today seems to strike the right balance. It would only apply to calls that are, include a threat of serious and imminent unlawful action posing a substantial risk to property, life, safety, or health. And it would limit call, access to caller ID information to threatened parties, law enforcement, and security personnel. At my suggestion, the item now seeks comment on how to define security personnel to ensure that it is an appropriate set of professionals. I thank the chairman for working me on this notice, and I will vote to approve. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner O'Reilly. Uh, this past uh, January, Jewish community centers, or JCCs, across the United States received a number of anonymous bomb threats. Months of investigation yielded few results, partly uh, because law enforcement officers weren't able to identify the callers, and partly this was because of one of our rules. That rule requires a carrier to honor a customer's request uh, that his or her telephone number not be transmitted or otherwise revealed to the party called, which prevents third parties, including law enforcement, from figuring out who it is who is calling. Uh, this past March, as was pointed out, the FCC granted a temporary waiver of this rule. And that waiver allowed carriers to share caller ID information from threatening calls to JCCs uh, to any carriers that serve JCCs and to law enforcement authorities. Today, we go a step further, and we propose to amend our rules to ensure that all threatened parties and law enforcement have access to caller ID in order to help identify and bring intimidating callers to justice. And to be sure, as uh, Commissioner O'Reilly pointed out, there are valid justifications for this rule. For example, uh, blocking caller ID information for calls made from domestic violence shelters excuse me, can protect people who are at risk of injury or even death. But the protections afforded by this rule can also be abused, as the events earlier this year illustrated. And in these circumstances, our view is that the core value of public safety outweighs the privacy interest a caller may have in his or her phone number. Now, sadly, instances of threatening calls like these are on the rise. According to one study, bomb threats made to schools increased by 1,461 percent between 2011 and 2016. Over half of those threats were made by phone. This is simply unacceptable. Our schools and our communities should not be held hostage to life-threatening taunts from anonymous callers. And our nation's finest uh, should not be hampered in investigating calls like that. Under the proposal set forth in today's NPRM, a carrier would not be required to keep private caller ID information from a threatening call, such as a bomb threat. And law enforcement, therefore, would not be hamstrung in pursuing an investigation. The notice also seeks comment on what safeguards should be in place to ensure that this exemption itself isn't abused. For instance, we ask how to define and to authenticate threatening calls and whether disclosure of such information should be limited to law enfor enforcement authorities or to certain entities. Now, our goal here, which is reflected, of course, in the rule itself, is to ensure respect for the legitimate privacy interests of non-threatening callers. I, like my colleagues, would like to thank Micah Caldwell, Nellie Fusner, Karen Schroeder, Kurt Schroeder, Richard Smith, Nancy Stevenson, Mark Stone, and Patrick Weber from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, Kirk Burgi, Madeline Finley, Daniel Kahn, Melissa droller Kirkle, Nirali Patel, and Ann Stevens from the Wireline Competition Bureau, and Doug Klein, Billy Layton, Rick Mallon, Linda Oliver, and Bill Richardson from the Office of General Counsel for their dedication to uh, protecting Americans from all manner of threatening callers. 
With that, we'll proceed to a vote on the item. Uh, Commissioner Clyburn? Aye. Commissioner O'Reilly? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thank you to the CGB staff for the great presentation. And uh, Madam Secretary, if you could uh, take us to the next item, please. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the fourth item on your agenda will be presented by the International Bureau and is entitled Worldview Satellites Limited, doing business as OneWeb, call sign S2963. And Thomas Sullivan, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Chief Sullivan, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The International Bureau is very pleased to present you with this order addressing OneWeb's petition to access the U.S. satellite market. Specifically, OneWeb wishes to provide broadband services utilizing a constellation of non-geostationary satellites. While the Commission approved several large constellations that proposed FSS non-geostationary systems in processing rounds over 15 years ago, no system launched. Significant advances in satellite technology over the past decade provided renewed opportunities for non-geostationary satellite networks to consider offering broadband services to rural and remote areas in the United States and around the world. OneWeb was the first company to file a request seeking commission approval to provide such services in the United States. The ensuing interest by the global satellite industry was significant. Eleven other proposals were filed in response to the processing round triggered by the OneWeb petition, and nine additional proposals were received to operate in portions of the V-band. These proposals range from constellations with as little as two satellites to as many as 4,000. The additional proposals are in varying stages of review by the Bureau's hardworking satellite division staff, and through their dedicated efforts, the Bureau recently placed many of these applications out for public comment. I'm joined at the table by Troy Tanner, Deputy Chief, Jose Albuquerque, Chief of the Satellite Division, and Clay DeSell, Attorney Advisor in the Satellite Policy Branch. I would like to acknowledge the outstanding contributions on this item from other colleagues in the Commission and in the International Bureau, especially Chip Fleming, Cal Krautkramer, and Carl Kensinger, as well as from our colleagues in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, the Office of General Counsel, and the Office of Engineering and Technology. Clay will present the item. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. The order and declaratory ruling before you would grant U.S. market access to the OneWeb satellite system, a proposed constellation of 720 satellites capable of providing broadband anywhere in America. Specifically, it would grant OneWeb market access for a low Earth orbit satellite system authorized by the United Kingdom and operating in portions of the KU and KA frequency bands between 10 and 30 gigahertz. Many of these bands are shared with other uses under the Commission's rules. In these bands, the grant includes power limits and other conditions to protect terrestrial networks and geostationary satellite networks. This grant would be the first for a new generation of large, non-geostationary fixed satellite service systems. Eleven other applicants have proposed satellite systems in a processing round with OneWeb. This grant provides for equal access to spectrum among OneWeb and other systems authorized in the processing round. This grant is also conditioned on the outcome of pending rulemakings. Last year, the Commission began a proceeding to update its rules for all non-geostationary fixed satellite service systems. The record in that proceeding demonstrates broad support for many proposals and disagreement on some others. That record would be used to determine the final sharing criteria applicable to the OneWeb system and others like it. In addition, this grant in, uh, is conditioned on a pending request for rulemaking to allow greater terrestrial use of the 12.2 to 12.7 gigahertz frequency band, uh, that frequency band. So in order to facilitate OneWeb's goal of providing broadband access to Americans no matter where they live, the Bureau recommends adoption of this order and declaratory ruling and requests editorial privileges for technical and conforming edits. Thank you, Mr. DeSalle. We'll now proceed to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner Clyburn. Many of you have heard me talk about the powerful effects of a pilot project involving diabetic patients in rural, rural in Ruleville, Mississippi, which is rural. 
Thanks to the combined forces of a tablet and broadband access, after year one, none of the participating patients had hospital visits, resulting in a $339,000 savings in that state's Medicaid spending. Initiatives such as this improve health, com health outcomes and save dollars are most often of greatest need in the very communities that lack the preeminent game changer of our time, access to broadband, and not just the infrastructure which enables broadband, but broadband services that people can afford. The persistent challenge of bridging the digital and opportunities divide is why I am excited to see OneWeb and other satellite companies embark on a laudable quest to provide ubiquitous and affordable advanced communication services. Satellites are an integral part of our lives, but they are often taken for granted. Satellites provide support to the Department of Defense, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, as well as emergency services in our local communities. They're used to support GPS systems, essential in Mignon's and most of your daily travels. And they allow weather services to alert us when we need an umbrella for that morning commute. And now, advancements in technologies and reductions in manufacturing and launching costs have propelled innovation and promised to usher in a new era of competitive broadband offerings from satellite companies. As I stated during last year's 2020 policy forum, we must maintain a laser focus on finding solution for those, solutions for those who lack access to the communication services needed for today's connected world. The proposals offered by OneWeb and others participating in this NGSO FSS processing round offer us an opportunity once again to pivot away from simply discussing the problem to finding solutions. Congratulations once again to Tom Sullivan for his appointment um, as permanent chief. And I'd like to thank you as always, Jose Albuquerque, and the staff of the International Bureau for your work on this important item. I look forward to continuing to work with you and my colleagues as we strive to create a more digitally inclusive society while enabling a space for more innovation and competition in the communication sector. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's been much excitement about the next generation of non-geostationary satellite orbit systems. If all the differing visions materialize, they will facilitate high-speed broadband connectivity to the hardest to reach portions of our country, enabling the offering of service to the unserved. A few question marks remain. For instance, these systems are incredibly ambitious, involving a scale of satellite deployments that we've not seen before. One web system calls for more than 700 satellites, and another entity with a pending application seeks to launch more than 4,000 satellites and some of the NGSO systems planned in the V-band are even larger. Will some of these systems come to fruition? More than likely. Will all of these systems be launched? That seems like a stretch. Will we facilitate the deployment of next generation technologies and let the market and the American consumer determine their success or failure? That should certainly be our directive. For this reason, I generally support today's order. However, those who read today's item will be quick to notice that the scope of these systems has raised many issues, such as preventing inline interference and orbital debris, which will need to be considered further. There are also multiple conditions on OneWeb's application and approval. For example, access to some frequencies that could be restricted by future multi-channel video distribution and data service proceedings, and our action today is conditioned on the outcome of the larger NGSO's uh, rulemaking. This item highlights what needs to be addressed and with any luck, we will resolve these proceedings as quickly as possible. Hopefully, our action today will provide NGSO applicants some level of certainty, permitting them to obtain investment and make future plans, but this item is more, than a, is more of a first step rather than a middle or final one. Going forward, there should be more holistic conversation and appropriate consideration of the complete picture of spectrum needs for both NGSOs and terrestrial use. As I've stated before, the satellite and wireless industries continue on a collision course, both here and internationally, as they seek spectrum for future systems. 
Generally, I remain concerned that we may be overlooking and foregoing opportunities for the clearing and sharing of spectrum by permitting additional uses on a piecemeal basis. I thank the chairman for very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, humans have long sought inspiration from the heavens, from the ancient Egyptians orienting the pyramids towards certain stars, to the Greeks using constellations to write their mythology. In modern times, we've done the same, with over 1,000 active satellites currently in orbit. Well, today, the FCC attempts to harness that inspiration as we seek to make the promise of high-speed internet access a reality for more Americans, partly through the skies. Over a year ago, OneWeb was the first company to seek approval uh, to enter the United States market with a system of high-capacity satellites that orbit closer to the Earth than any satellite ever has before. The goal of this non-geostationary satellite orbit, or NGSO technology, is to provide global, high-speed broadband service, and its use case is particularly compelling in remote and hard-to-serve areas. Well, today, as Chief Sullivan and the staff of the Bureau pointed out, we are granting OneWeb's petition for U.S. market access. OneWeb is leading the charge with its planned constellation of 720 satellites and others are close behind. After OneWeb filed its petition, several other companies did the same or applied for a U.S. license in those same spectrum bands. These applications are being reviewed by the International Bureau's excellent engineering staff. And we hope to approve many more constellations because we know that the more companies compete, the more consumers win. Additionally, the FCC also has an ongoing rulemaking proceeding that proposes to update the current uh, NGSO fixed satellite service rules to better accommodate this next generation of systems. But first, thing, first things first, uh, the order lays the foundation for the deployment of future low Earth orbit satellites while establishing carefully measured standards to ensure that these NGSO constellations won't interfere with their terrestrial or geostationary counterparts. And the order provides that OneWeb will need to accommodate inline interference avoidance and spectrum sharing with other NGSOs in the future. Many thanks to Jose Albuquerque, Christopher Baer, Clay DeSell, Stephen Duell, Chip Fleming, Jennifer Gilsonen, Carl Kensinger, Cal Kratt Kramer, Catherine Medley, Tom Sullivan and Troy Tanner in the International Bureau, Nicholas Oros and Jameson Prime in the Office of Engineering and Technology, Peter Duranko, Neshe Gundelsberger, Matthew Pearl, Blaise Sinto, and Joel Tabenblatt from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, and last but certainly not least, Deborah Broderson and David Horowitz from the Office of General Counsel. Thousands of years ago, people looked to the stars to predict their destiny, and it is our hope that in the future years to come, uh, peop Americans will be able to use these networks and they're in the sky to make their own destiny. What an exciting time this is. And with that, we will move to a vote on the item. Commissioner Clyburn. Aye. Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. Chair votes aye as well. The item is uh, adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thank you to the staff of the International Bureau. Uh, Madam Secretary, if you could uh, move us to the next item on the agenda. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the fifth item on your agenda will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau and is entitled Improving Competitive Broadband Access to Multiple Tenant Environments. And Chris Monteith, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Uh, Ms. Monteith, whenever you and your folks are ready. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Good morning. The Wireline Competition Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration a notice of inquiry seeking comment on barriers to deployment in multiple tenant environments, or MTEs, and on ways to better enable innovation and competition in the market for high-speed Internet services. I would like to thank the entire WCB team for their hard work on this item, as well as our colleagues in MB and OGC for their review and valuable feedback. Seated at the table with me are Madeline Finley, Deputy Bureau Chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau, and from the Competition Policy Division, Daniel Kahn, Division Chief, Terry Natoli, Deputy Division Chief, and John Visklowski, Attorney Advisor. Although, although he's unable to attend the meeting today, I'd also like to thank Assistant Division Chief Adam Copeland for his work on this item. John will now present the item. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. 
The item before you seeks comment on ways to enhance competition in and the deployment of broadband high-speed services in commercial and residential premises, such as apartment buildings, condominium buildings, shopping malls, and cooperatives that are occupied by multiple entities, otherwise known as multiple tenant environments, or MTEs. If adopted, the notice of inquiry would first seek comment on whether there are state and local regulations that may inhibit or have the effect of inhibiting broadband deployment and competition within MTEs. Second, the notice would seek comment on whether we should revisit the Commission's decision in the 2010 Exclusive Contracts Order not to take action regarding exclusive marketing and bulk billing arrangements among multi-channel video programming distributors that provide services in MTEs. Third, the notice would seek comment on how revenue sharing agreements and exclusive wiring arrangements are affecting the level of broadband competition within MTEs. Fourth, the notice would seek comment on any additional types of contractual provisions and non-contractual practices that impact the ability of broadband providers to compete in MTEs. Fifth, the notice would seek comment on the Commission's jurisdictional and statutory authority to facilitate broadband deployment and competition within MTEs, including Sections 201B and 628 of the Act, on which the Commission has previously relied in prohibiting exclusive service arrangements in MTEs. The notice would also seek comment on the extent to which Section 253 of the Act can serve as a basis for the Commission to address state or local regulations with respect to facilities deployment and competition within MTEs. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vesklosky. We'll now turn to Commissioner Clyburn for any comments she might have. Thank you. If the lack of fixed broadband is problem number one, the clear number two is figuring out how to unleash greater opportunities for competition and choice. Today, a mere 24% of census blocks in the United States have competition, and in rural America, where the economics of building broadband make it a more difficult business case, choice is rare to non-existent. Only 6% of rural census blocks have fixed broadband competition. But what may surprise some is that broadband competition is a problem in densely populated areas as well. Millions of Americans have no competitive options, not due to a broadband provider's unwillingness to challenge an incumbent, but because someone else is foreclosing such opportunities. Businesses in multiple households in multiple tenant environments, or MTEs, are sometimes precluded from choosing a broadband provider because of arrangements between the incumbent and the property owner. This is why I am pleased that we are adopting this notice of inquiry, which seeks comment on how we can enhance broadband deployment and promote competition for businesses and residents in such communities. More specifically, we ask how state and local policies have impacted broadband deployment in MTEs and hope to identify what contractual or non-contractual practices impact broadband providers in these locations. Additionally, this NOI seek, seeks comment on what statutory provisions serve the basis for providing broadband deployment and competition within MTEs. But this is not our first rodeo when it comes to addressing this issue. In fact, the Commission banned exclusive agreements that it concluded locked up this market. But there are reports that these, that these rules we enacted were being circumvented. For example, even though a broadband provider may be prohibited from entering into an, an exclusive agreement, that might not stop an MTE from choosing to simply reject competing services despite strong interest from their residents. Additionally, some provide network operators marketing materials in their new resident welcome package, which encourages those residents to purchase services from those specific companies. 
Some companies even offer property owners a revenue sharing deal, which may actually incent anti-competitive practices. We ask if these practices are predatory, and if it is determined that they are, they should end. This NOI represents an important first step to ensure that barriers to competition are torn down. Many MTE occupants are unaware of the deals between their building owners and these companies, but it is important for consumers and potential competitors to have the power to compete and choose the provider that would serve them best. Competition most often than not brings lower prices and greater innovation, so it is imperative that we do all we can to promote these ideals. My thanks go to the Wireline Competition Bureau for your efforts to facilitate greater choice and enhance broadband deployment. And special congratulations to Chris Monteith on her first meeting as permanent bureau chief. Thank you, Commissioner Clyburn. Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The notice of inquiry before us opens another line of questions about how to promote broadband deployment, innovation, and competition. I applaud the chairman for his work on this matter. Well, I support having these discussions, and I'm willing to initiate this proceeding. I do want to be clear that I do wonder about some of the ideas contained within. First, I do not believe that the Commission has authority to regulate marketing practices such as web advertisements and the placement of brochures in the building or in welcome packets of new residents. Second, some of the concerns raised in this item, including about unfair or deceptive acts or practices, may be best addressed by the FTC. Finally, if the Commission ultimately adopts its recent proposal to classify broadband as an information service, much of this discussion would seem to be moot. My previous views on Section 706 as legal authority are well known, and the idea of applying Title II as an information service solely because the facilities might also carry a legacy voice service would be a deeply questionable step that could discourage the deployment of broadband contrary to the goals of the item. I look forward to carefully reviewing the record in this proceeding with an eye towards ensuring that any resulting proposals are grounded in the statute and sound public policy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Commissioner O'Reilly. Melrose Place, The Jeffersons, Seinfeld, Perfect Strangers, Three's Company, Friends, Good Times, and The Big Bang Theory. Now, what you might ask do these television shows have in common? Well, two things. First, on any given evening, Commissioner Clyburn is binge-watching them. <laughs> but more relevant here for this purpose, each takes place in an apartment building or, in the parlance, a multi-tenant environment, or MTE. Now, MTEs are residential uh, or commercial premises, including apartment buildings and shopping centers that are occupied by multiple tenants. Now, the people who live or work in MTEs want and need high-speed Internet access. But we've heard that there are sometimes barriers that discourage or even prevent broadband providers from serving them. For instance, a few months ago, I visited Rocket Fiber in Detroit, Michigan. And I saw for myself how this scrappy startup is connecting Motor City residents with a new gigabit broadband network. But the company explained to me that they were having trouble getting access to MTEs in order to uh, provide Internet access and competitive choice to folks in apartment buildings. This is a problem for tenants for obvious reasons. And it's also a problem for the company, since it could get a bigger return on the investment serving a more densely populated geographic area like an MTE. Now, to make sure we've got an accurate snapshot of the broadband marketplace within MTEs, we are beginning this notice of inquiry. We'll also think about what we can and should do to incentivize Internet service providers to make infrastructure investments relating to MTEs. Among other things, we will look at the state and local regulatory landscape. Uh, for example, in an effort to promote competition within MTEs, at least one community has banned certain contractual arrangements that guarantee an ISP the undisturbed use of inside wiring. However, new entrants apparently often use such contracts as evidence of likely success when they are seeking funding from lenders or investors. Does banning such contracts enhance or diminish competition in the broader marketplace? Well, we're soliciting the facts that will help us answer that question. Additionally, some argue that certain business practices impede competition, such as ISPs making deals with landlords or homeowners associations to exclusively market to residents or to bill all of them together at a discount. It's also been suggested that revenue sharing agreements between ISPs and landlords may not be in the best interests of residents. 
On the other hand, many contend that these exclusive marketing and bulk billing agreements may provide lower prices and better service to MT residents. Well, who's right? Here, too, we hope to collect the facts that can help us make an informed judgment. In sum, we are faced with tough questions of both law and economics. And I hope that this notice kickstarts a healthy discussion. For whether Americans live in a deluxe apartment in the sky, on 129 West 81st Street, a Chicago housing project, or a stylish courtyard in West Hollywood, uh, they deserve digital opportunity like anybody else. Uh, finally, as we commence this inquiry, I want to thank the dedicated staff of the Wireline Competition Bureau, the Media Bureau, and the Office of General Counsel for their work on this item. Michelle Carey, Adam Copeland, Katie Costello, Madeline Finley, Martha Heller, Daniel Kahn, Karen Kosar, Billy Layton, Bakari Middleton, Chris Monteith, Mary Beth Murphy, Brendan Murray, Eric Ralph, Terry Natoli, and last but not least, solely because of alphabetization, John Visklosky. We really appreciate your efforts. And with that, we'll move to a vote on the NOI. Uh, Commissioner Clyburn. Aye. Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. The chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted. Thank you to the staff. Uh, and uh, Madam Secretary, if you could uh, take us to the next item on the agenda, please. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, the sixth item on your agenda will also be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau. And it's entitled Modernization of Payphone Compensation Rules, Implementation of the Payphone Te Pay Telephone Reclassification and Compensation Provisions of the Telecommunications Act of 1996, 2016 Biennial Review of Telecommunications Regulations. And Chris Monteith, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Monteith, I'm we're counting on you to incorporate a wire reference into your presentations. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Thanks. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The Wireline Competition Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration a notice of proposed rulemaking and order. This item explores ways to modernize the Commission's payphone compensation compliance procedures to reduce regulations whose costs may now outweigh their intended benefits. If adopted, the item would propose or seek comment on reforming the Commission's rules applicable to payphone compensation compliance procedures and weigh the pay, waive the payphone compensation audit and associated reporting requirements for 2017 and 2018. I would like to thank the entire team for their hard work on this item. Seated at the table with me are Madeline Finley, Deputy Chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau, and from the Competition Policy Division, Dan Kahn, Division Chief, Terry Natoli, Deputy Division Chief, and Michelle Burlov, Attorney Advisor. Michelle will present the item. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The item before you seeks to eliminate regulations that may no longer be justified. If adopted, the notice of proposed rulemaking portion of this item would propose eliminating requirement, the requirement that completing carriers conduct annual audits of their payphone call tracking systems and file with the Commission associated system audit reports prepared by independent third-party auditors. The notice would seek comment on the dramatic decrease in payphone usage and the compensation paid to payphone service providers in recent years. The notice also would seek comment on the costs of complying with the annual audit and associated reporting requirements and whether those costs now outweigh the benefits, whether the option to enter into alternative compensation arrangements with payphone service providers remains a feasible alternative to the annual audit requirement, and whether the decline in payphone usage warrants more generally, to, uh, warrants changes more generally to the Commission's payphone compensation process rules. The order, if adopted, would grant a waiver of the annual audit and associated reporting obligations to all completing carriers for 2017 and 2018 to prevent completing carriers from incurring compliance expenses while this rulemaking is pending. The order would not affect the completing carrier's underlying compensation obligations. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial pr privileges extended only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Verlove. I will now go to comments from the bench, starting with Commissioner Clyburn. For those like me who pretend that these shades of brown are our natural hair color, 
We can clearly remember the frantic search for dimes and quarters when we needed to make a call and a payphone was our only option. Today, for many, the payphone is all but a relic from the past. And for the residents of Plainview, Nebraska, it has become quite literally just that. The last pay phone serving the 12,000 residents of Plainview went off the hook for good and is now one of the newest features in the town's public museum. On this, we all agree. The communications landscape has changed dramatically, and the number of pay phones operating across America has fallen dramatically. When I came to the commission in 2009, there were about 600,000 pay phones in service. With increasing mobile penetration in use, their presence has dropped to under 100,000 today. And in a rapidly evolving communications industry, we find it necessary to assess and reassess the regulations on the books when it comes to payphone pay service. In today's notice of proposed rulemaking, we see comment on eliminating the payphone call tracking system annual audit and associated reporting requirement and suspend those requirements for the remainder of 2017. The existing audit rules were originally necessary to ensure that the competing carriers adequately compensated payphone service providers for coinless access and subscriber toll-free calls. But in 2017, we must acknowledge that it may no longer be necessary to require these audits especially if other rules provide sufficient safeguards and the cost outweigh the revenue benefits. It is important to point out that the item does not call for an end of compensation tracking and it certainly does not suggest the elimination of other payphone protections. Lest we forget, there are still some communities that rely on payphones for their communications, especially during an emergency. What our item does call for is consideration of how we can make the audit process more efficient, ensuring that it more accurately corresponds to the industry realities of today. It is my sincere hope that increased efficiencies realized from this and other rulemakings can lead to new innovations in providing service, especially to underserved communities. We have already seen such successes in the metamorphosis of pay phones into public Wi-Fi hubs in New York City, and I remain upbeat about what the future may bring. Though the last pay phone of Plainview is now silent, it will continue to serve as a reminder of how far we have come in a relatively short period of time and why nationwide access to communication services is so important. For all of these reasons, I approve. Thanks go out to the Wireless Competition Bureau for your work here to remove outdated regulations. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I support the initiation of this proceeding to consider eliminating the annual payphone tracking system audit requirement and the associated reporting requirement. I also support the related waiver. Like many FCC rules still on the books, this one appears to have outlived its usefulness and is likely that the cost far outweighed any benefits. Indeed, the record to date suggests that the cost of the audit is higher than the amount paid for payphone compensation. This issue came to the Commission's attention through a waiver petition filed by impacted carriers and through comments submitted in response to the Commission's 2016 Biennial Review Public Notice. Now that companies have seen the Commission is committed to clearly removing regulatory underbrush, I hope that more commenters will step forward with additional ideas, something I've encouraged during my time here. I also look forward to seeing more progress made through the Biennial Review proceeding, which I expect to contain further proposals for appropriate deregulation. In addition to removing outdated rules from our books, the Commission should also get serious about including sunset provisions in new rules going forward. Such provisions would provide a defined check in point to reflect on whether rules remain necessary in light of the rapid technological and market changes that characterize this sector of the economy. Should the benefits continue to outweigh the costs, they can certainly be retained by an affirmative act of the Commission. However, I expect that in many cases they will be overtaken by such changes. 
In those instances, sunset provisions enable the Commission to remove the rules without further expenditure of staff resources or impacted entities. I thank the Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Riley. In Maroon 5's 2012 song, Payphone, Adam Levine sang, and in the public interest, I will not sing it here, I'm at a payphone trying to call home all of my change I spent on you. But those lyrics become increasingly anachronistic with each passing year, as Commissioner Clyburn pointed out. As mobile connectivity explodes, the number of payphones in the United States has dropped precipitously from a peak of 2.1 million in 1999 to under 100,000 at the end of 2016. That's a 95% decrease. In light of these developments, we are starting a rulemaking to consider whether certain payphone audit requirements have outlived their usefulness. You see, despite the Maroon 5 song, payphone providers, payphone owners rather, are often aren't compensated by a caller inserting a coin into a phone. Instead, when callers use coinless access codes like calling cards or make toll-free card calls from a payphone, it's often the companies that carry those calls or completing carriers that compensate payphone owners. Now, the FCC currently requires audits of completing carriers to make sure that payments owed to payphone owners are accurate. But we've heard that compliance with these rules now costs carriers a large fraction of, if not more than, the total compensation that the audits are meant to verify. For example, in at least one case, a completing carrier that conducted such an audit spent more than five times the total compensation it owed to payphone owners. On top of all that, there haven't been any complaints about insufficient payphone compensation in a number of years. So if ever a situation called for examining whether a regulation was outdated, whether the marketplace had changed, whether the costs outweighed the benefits, this is it. We will figure out if these audits are net beneficial, and if they aren't, we'll clear them from the books. I, too, like my colleagues, would like to thank the staff who contributed to this item, including Michelle Burlove, Madeline Finley, Daniel Kahn, Doug Klein, Rick Mallon, Chris Monteith, Eric Ralph, and Terry Natoli. As we proceed with our efforts to modernize the Commission's rules to match today's marketplace, we will continue to rely on your expertise, even if you do not include any references to the wire. Uh, with that, we'll move to a vote on the item. Commissioner Clyburn. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. And jumping the five, the chair votes aye as well. I, the item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thank you to the staff. And Madam Secretary, if you could now take us to the next item on the agenda. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, you will now hear an enforcement case for your consideration, a notice of apparent liability for forfeiture that involves the apparent violation of Section 227E of the Communications Act, as well as Section 64.1604 of the Commission's rules. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And then, Mr. Curtis, whenever you're ready to go. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. One second. Yes, that's right. Uh, yes, oh, if you would give me a moment. Okay. Uh, so as the Commission has done in past cases that involve the presentation of a notice of apparent liability or for forfeiture or NAL at an open meeting, uh, we're going to switch up what we do here a bit. As with all open meeting items, the Bureau circulated the NAL to every commissioner three weeks ago. But there is a long-standing practice at the agency that we do not publicly disclose the target of an investigation unless and until the FCC decides to take enforcement action. For NALs that are adopted at open meetings, this means that the agency formally votes on the item and then hears a brief presentation from the Bureau before proceeding to any comments that state uh, commissioners may make. This process ensures that the target will not be publicly disclosed until the FCC has voted to take action. Uh, we are going to follow that precedent here and move directly to a vote on the item and then follow the process that I just outlined. Commissioner Clyburn? Uh, how do you vote? Uh, oh, aye. <laughs> uh, Commissioner O'Reilly? Concur. Uh, the chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as I suspect will be requested. And uh, we will now turn to uh, Madam Secretary. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the Enforcement Bureau will now provide a brief presentation on the adopted enforcement action. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Thank you for your consideration and your votes on today's item. 
which is a notice of apparent liability for forfeiture addressing apparent violations of the law and the Commission's rules by one of the most disruptive robocallers we have come across at the Bureau. With me today at the table are Michael Scarato, legal advisor, Richard Heinemann, Chief of the Telecommunications Consumers Division, Christy Thompson, who is the Deputy Chief of that division, and Daniel Stepanisic, uh, Honors Attorney in the division. Um, Christy will now present the item. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. This Notice of Apparent Liability, or NAL, proposes a penalty in the amount of $120 million against Mr. Adrian Abramovich and a number of companies that he owns for spamming consumers with hundreds of millions of spoofed robocalls in apparent violation of the Truth and Caller ID Act, and which is codified in Section 227 of the, excuse me, of the Communications Act. The size and scope of Adrian Abramovich's operation is staggering. Through an extensive investigation, the Bureau determined that Abramovich was responsible for placing close to 100 million robocalls in just the last three months of 2016. Abramovich runs a sophisticated robocall marketing operation. The evidence shows that Abramovich falsified caller ID information of each of his robocalls to match the area code and first three digits of the recipient's own phone number. This type of falsification is known as neighbor spoofing because it displays fake caller ID that deceptively leads consumers to believe they are receiving a call from somebody who lives nearby, such as a local business or institution. The evidence shows that Abramovich's purpose in spoofing the caller ID was to harm, defraud, or otherwise wrongfully obtain something of value. Specifically, the recordings that Abramovich played when a consumer answered one of his robocalls falsely claimed that the caller was from a well-known American travel company like Marriott, TripAdvisor, Hilton, or Expedia. In order to entice the recipients to press one and speak with a sales agent. In reality, those calls came from Adrian Abramovich, who would pass unwitting consumers on to sales agents in foreign, tra foreign travel companies that had no affiliation with the um, trusted American companies. Consumers who were enticed by the invocation of a reputable American travel company were misled into doing business with unknown foreign companies. Abramovich's robocalls enraged consumers and harmed the goodwill and reputation of well-established American travel companies with which he falsely claimed affiliation. And just as a note, all of us on the team in this investigation received at least one robocall that had the hallmarks of an Abramovich robocall. These apparently illegal spoofed robocalls were not only disruptive to consumers and businesses, they were downright dangerous. Abramovich's calls burdened the nation's telephone networks generally and threatened to disable the network of a major medical paging company, causing significant service disruptions and interfering with the ability of hospitals to reach on-call medical staff in emergency situations. Because of the harmful and fraudulent intent behind Abramovich's actions in falsifying caller ID information, Abramovich's spoofing apparently violated the Truth in Caller ID Act, the penalty we propose is based on the Bureau's review of 80,000 apparently illegal spoofed robocalls that Abramovich made to American consumers. This morning, the Bureau is also releasing a citation against Adrian Abramovich for making illegal robocalls in violation of the TCPA, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, as well as for engaging in federal wire fraud, which is also a violation of the Communications Act. For the reasons I've described and with additional detail in the Notice of Apparent Liability, the Enforcement Bureau supports the Commission's adoption of this item. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Now we will proceed to comments from the bench. Commissioner Clyburn. Anyone who has ever contacted the FCC's Washington, D.C. headquarters is familiar with these six digits, 202418. Given this association, if that area code and prefix appeared on your caller ID, you would more likely answer the call, or at least I would like to think you would. <laughs> but when phone numbers are spoofed 
and what appears to be a trusted or familiar source actually originates from a party intent on misleading, defrauding, causing harm, or wrongfully obtaining something of value, we each have a serious and potentially dangerous problem on our hands. Unwanted wordable car calls are universally hated. Too often, they disrupt some of our most precious and increasingly rare moments of peace and quiet. And to say that the case before us is one of the most troubling that I have ever seen in this context is one of the biggest understatement I have made in years. One man, a single individual, is apparently responsible for nearly 100 million robocalls during a three-month period period. Adrian Abramovich alleged spoofing activities has had a direct and adverse in financial impact on consumers, the reputational harm of respected business, American businesses, and if that were not enough, has been a serious threat to public safety. During the FCC's Enforcement Bureau's review of these apparent spoof telephone calls, it was discovered that some consumers paid hundreds of dollars for vacations that differed significantly from the ones presented to them. This has caused incalculable harm to well-regarded American travel companies as their names were misappropriated and their hard-earned reputations were maligned as customers were misled, presumably for financial gain. Mr. Abramovich's apparent robocall spoofing scheme also disrupted an emergency medical paging service designed to ensure that first responders receive immediate critical alerts. I wish I could promise the American people that today's action will put an end to all unwanted and, as this case makes apparent, dangerous robocalls. Sadly, this a notice of apparent liability addresses only a fraction of the 2.6 billion robocalls that U-mail robocall, U-mail's robocall index reports were made just during the month of May. But there is one thing that I know on which we all agree. If there is any case of where a first impression should be lasting, it is this one. I wholeheartedly support being as tough as we can justify on anyone who would violate the public's trust, intentionally violate the Commission's rules, and put people at risk for apparent personal gain. And a proposed penalty of $120 million, the largest in, FCC's, in the FCC's history, shows just how serious we are in stamping out the largest spoofed robocall campaign we have yet to investigate. The Commission has an obligation to ensure that all of its rules are robustly enforced, including those that protect consumers against 911 outages, cramming, slamming, and other core consumer protections. A Commission that is truly committed to putting consumers first must never issue a hall pass on any communications provider that egregiously violates the Truth in Calling ID Act or any of our, outst of our standing rules. The American people are counting on us to be the voice that stands against practices that harm competition and limit consumer choice. We have much more work to do when it comes to these goals, but today it pleases me to say we have taken a noteworthy step. My thanks to the Enforcement Bureau staff for your extensive work on this item and for your continued effort to, efforts to address the Commission's number one consumer complaint, illegal robocalls. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll now turn to Commissioner Riley. Thank you, Chair, Mr. Chairman. I have, appreciate the opportunity to speak. I generally don't make too many comments about NALs, but a couple things here and why I concurred. And, one is it goes to the presentation that, that, that was made, and the sentence, if I understood it correctly, was spamming consumers with robocalls. And there's two parts there that caused me heartburn. One, later on it was clarified it was illegal robocalls, and quite frankly, it's not spam. And I, I, what, I guess it gets to the, to the heart of the item and what I'm asking for and have asked for and sought out of the Enforcement Bureau is more precise uh, items and, and we we had this issue and I raised it. It didn't seem to get addressed because I don't believe there's an intent to harm by Mr. Abramovich. I think there's an, a definitely an intent to defraud. I think Commissioner Clyburn mentioned defrauding uh, and a number of different 
terms that would go with it, but I don't know that he's in, intentionally trying to harm people, and that's what the standard is uh, in our rules. And then in terms of neighborhood spoofing, which has been uh, addressed, I have serious concerns that the, the, the precise structure is not uh, is intended there because there are positive aspects of VoIP that allow a consumer to use uh, a, a, a local uh, telephone number, and I don't want to see that wiped out just grabbed in total as part of a neighborhood spoofing effort. It's not all bad. It's There are precise definitions that need to be used here, and I don't know that we did that in that instance, and that's why I concurred, and hopefully we'll, we'll address those as we go forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, have you ever gotten a call in which the phone number looks pretty familiar? The area code matches yours. The next three numbers, uh, the first three numbers of the prefix matches yours, but you can't quite tell who it is. Well, so you're not alone. This sometimes results from a tactic known as neighbor spoofing. And inveterate robocallers are using it to bombard the American people with illegal robocalls without getting caught. Neighbor spoofing often tricks consumers into answering, since they think the person on the other end must be someone from his or her local community. Well, as Commissioner Clyburn pointed out, robocalling is consistently the top-ranked category of complaints that consumers bring to the FCC. And that's why I'm pleased today that the FCC is taking major, unprecedented action against what appears to be the most egregious neighbor spoofing robocalling scheme that we have ever seen. Adrian Abramovich, through several faux marketing companies that he owns and manages, appears to have made 96,758,223 robocalls between October 1st, 2016 and December 31st of 2016. 96,758,223. That works out to over 1 million unwanted calls every day and almost 44,000 calls every hour. Now, the scheme uh, that Mr. Abramovich apparently engaged in was described well during Ms. Thompson's presentation. I would simply observe that Mr. Abramovich appears to have been no passive party to this scheme. He apparently found it profitable to send to these live operators the most vulnerable Americans, typically the elderly, to be built out of their hard-earned money. Many consumers spent from a few hundred dollars up to a few thousand dollars on these exclusive vacation packages. And this scheme was especially abhorrent because, as Ms. Thompson pointed out, it appears to have substantially disrupted the operations of an emergency paging, a medical paging provider, which could have had a life or death impact. Now, thanks to the tenacious sleuthing by the terrific staff of our Enforcement Bureau, we were able to connect the dots among numerous consumer complaints. And those dots, uh, when combined, showed us the scope of Mr. Abramovich's apparent scheme. The Bureau hand-verified over 80,000 calls from this three-month period, in addition to being bombarded with some of these calls themselves. Every single one of these hand-verified calls was showed uh, that was spoofed uh, to show what consumers must have thought was a local number. The Bureau also interviewed several people who had received calls, none of whom had provided their consent. Now, today marks the first time that the FCC has taken enforcement action against a large-scale spoofing operation under the Truth and, Calling, uh, Truth and Caller ID Act. This FCC is an active cop on the beat for consumers, and a cop that means business when it comes to consumers' top concern, the scourge of robocalls. We aim to put unlawful robocallers out of business and to deter anyone else from hatching a business plan that depends on plundering American consumers' pocketbooks. Thank you to the dedicated staff of the Enforcement Bureau, including Vilma Anderson, Tamara Baxter, Michael Karowitz, Lisa Gelb, uh, uh, Richard Heinemann, Lisa Landers, Letitia Middleton, Nikasha Ramsey, Stacey Ruffin-Smith, Michael Scarato, Daniel Spasanisic, Christy Thompson, Kim Thorne, Melanie Tiano, Bridget Washington, and Lisa Williford for the meticulous work that went into this very complex investigation. Uh, the item having been adopted, you are now excused from the table. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Secretary. Actually, you stay where you are, I think we're going to do. Uh, just, I think that concludes our agenda. I'm so wound up. All right. Uh, <laughs> does anyone have any announcements that they would like to make? Yes, a, a couple of you don't mind, Mr. Chair. If, if you give me permission to stay at the table. Thank you. Singing, it's even better. So. <laughs> Don't don't touch me. Um, I would like uh, to uh, introduce uh, the summer interns uh, uh, for the Clyburn team. Uh, if you're here, please stand. Uh, Jamila Toussaint is a third-year law student at the University of Georgia School of Law. She is also a graduate of Howard University, where she received her degree in legal communications and sociology. I'd like to welcome her to the team. Jeremy Greenberg 
is a third year law student at Georgetown University. He's a graduate of Ithaca College, where he received his degree in cinema photography and the media arts. And uh, Alicia Valentin is a PhD student in communications culture and media studies program uh, at the at Howard University. She believes in digital inclusion, um, and she believes that is an important step in creating an equitable society. Thus, her research examines cities' efforts to promote broadband services that benefit low-income and minority uh, consumers. I would like to uh, thank three uh, wonderful interns for being part of the team this summer and um, uh, treat them well because they deserve it. Absolutely. Uh, welcome aboard. <laughs> Commissioner Riley? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I generally don't ha often have announcements, but I have two. One, one, both actually are quite sad, but uh, I think are, are, are appropriate. One, I wanted to acknowledge the passing, and I, I will apologize for pronouncing a name, but I'll say uh, Doran Bunkin, I had a chance to uh, attend uh, her service for her passing. Uh, so, a dedicated member of the commission. Just a wonderful service to see uh, her family and, and, and how committed she was, not just to the commission, but also to her community. Uh, it was, it was, a very moving moment uh, to, to see how involved she was. And, uh, and I got to say, uh, I remember working with her on an item in the Las uh, Vegas airport on channel sharing, and she was just so uh, focused on the commission, but also just more dynamic. Than, and that highlights how all the people in the, the uh, agency have such uh, uh, value con contributions outside of the building itself. And the second purpose for, for bothering everyone today is to acknowledge what everyone already knows, and that is that my chief of staff is departing um, in a few weeks to head to the House of Representatives to work for the subcommittee on uh, work for, for subcommittee chair Marsha Blackburn. There aren't enough words uh, in my vocabulary to thank Robin for all of her contributions to my office uh, and for her family for lending her to us. Um, I've always said that if there's anything positive that came from my office, it's because of my good staff, and that certainly applies to Robin. Um, if there's anything bad that came from my office, that certainly came from me, myself. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I can't thank her enough for, for spending the time that she has with, with us. It is a big loss to our shop, but uh, we look forward to doing whatever she wants in her new role, uh, overseeing <laughs> the commission. So, so I thank you for your indulgence. Well, thank you, Commissioner Riley. I'll start there. Uh, I personally scoured uh, parts zero and one of the Code of Federal Regulations to figure out uh, whether among the ample authorities granted to the chairman of this agency, we could prevent a dedicated public servant like Robin from leaving our employ to go to Congress. I could find no such authority, so it is with great reluctance that we have to bid adieu to Robin. Uh, Robin, it's been terrific working with you uh, over the past several years. We are really grateful for your efforts uh, and, uh, more importantly, for your friendship. We wish you and your family all the best as you make the transition, and if we can ever be of a service, uh, please do let us know, especially if it is in a social as opposed to a professional capacity. Sounds like you're going to have an opportunity in July. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We shall see. Um, also, I, uh, like Commissioner O'Reilly, I wanted to uh, note the passing of Duran Bunkin. Uh, she came to the FCC directly after graduating from Yale Law School, and uh, she spent many years here at the agency in two different stints working in public service, which I think speaks to uh, the spirit uh, with which uh, she embraced uh, this agency. Uh, she was Chief Policy Counsel in the Video Bureau, uh, Video Division of the Media Bureau, as well as a member of the Incentive Auction Task Force. Uh, after playing a major role in some very complicated issues, including the Disney ABC merger, she went into private practice where she had a very accomplished tenure as a partner at Wiley Ryan. Uh, she was an inspiration to many around this agency, not least to my own media advisor, Allison Nemeth. And uh, she won the Catherine Forster Public Service Award just last year here at the Commission. Uh, Duran's dedication to her work was surpassed only by her dedication to her wonderful family, her husband Doug, and to their four children, Eliana, Zev, Jessica, and Davika. Uh, to say the least, our hearts are saddened by her passing, and we say goodbye to an exemplary friend, an exemplary coworker, and a terrific wife and mother. Uh, I also want to note the uh, departure of a few other folks. Uh, first, uh, Fred Booker. Uh, Fred is, uh, head, has headed up our Administrative Operations Security Center. I don't know if Fred is around. He's right. Oh, there you are. All right. Um, Fred has spent a combined 37 years in military or federal service. Uh, he served in the United States Army with distinction, and after retiring from the Army, uh, he worked for a number of non-governmental entities and the U.S. Trade Representative before coming to the FCC seven years ago. Uh, Fred has done a great job 
over the last several years, and I've gotten to know him and even his son a little bit. And so I just wanted to recognize Fred and say thank you uh, for your service to this agency. Uh, also, uh, Tracy Schofer, uh, who is here. Uh, I know he's not going to stand up, but I hope he will indulge me uh, if, if, I don't, uh, if he doesn't mind standing so we can recognize him. Fr Tracy is the head of our, the FCC's Transportation Services. Uh, Tracy is just a gem of a human being. He's been at the FCC for 20 years and two months, uh, starting in the chairmanship of uh, uh, Reed Hunt all the way through to now. Uh, Tracy is just terrific. He's a man of few words, and in fact, uh, if you ask, if you tell him congratulations, he's probably likely just to give you a tight-lipped smile and go on his way. But don't let it fool you. Tracy is a Renaissance man. It's a deep appreciation for classical music. I can think off the top of my head about a number of different conversations we've had about the beauty of Beethoven. Just today we were talking about how Pablo Casals said that Bach cleanses the soul. He's just really got an appreciation for music, which draws on his time from uh, when he was with the United States Marine Corps. He served in the band uh, at the Marine Corps. He uh, went to Vietnam uh, in the late 60s, which was, uh, of course, uh, no small thing in those days. And he came back and has dedicated himself, for the most part, to public service here at the commission. So, uh, Trace, it's been a joy to know you. Uh, we will miss you in the future. And I'm so grateful to be able to call you a friend. Uh, I also want to recognize the uh, temporary departure from our office. Uh, Dr. Jay Schwartz is leaving. Uh, for a good reason, his wife is expecting any day now uh, their third child, a uh, little girl, uh, who will not be named Ajita, as I understand it, which is the female form of Ajit, but Goodness. nonetheless is welcomed uh, to the Schwartz family. Uh, we uh, wish him and his wife all the best, if not a few Zs along the way. And uh, uh, while he's gone, we are thrilled to welcome Christine Fargetstein uh, to our office. Uh, Christine is a legal advisor to the Wildline Competition Bureau. She uh, graduated from United, the University of South, uh, South Dakota, University of San Diego, uh, not as beautiful and warm as South Dakota, uh, and from George Mason Law School. She's served here at the commission in a variety of capacities. She's done a tremendous job already this week. Um, I have uh, not stolen her lunch many yet, but I have quite literally stolen her lunch. I, unbeknownst to me, we like the same salad, so I apologize publicly, Christine, for stealing your lunch on Wednesday. Um, we're really thrilled to have her on board, and uh, we're really excited about the work she's going to do in the time to come. We also have a few clerks uh, who are arriving, uh, who have arrived, rather. Kenzie Nothnagel, if you don't mind standing up. She's a rising 2L at, and hold on, Marlene Dorch, the Ohio State University's Moritz College of Law. <laughs> uh, prior to attending law school, she worked as an actress in New York City, where, as she says, she uh, appeared in plays that you haven't heard of and TV shows that never aired. Nonetheless, she is in IMDb, if you take a look, which is something I can only aspire to. Uh, based on her experience at the commission so far, she says that our, her, the television show that our office most reminds her of is Full House, with me occupying the role of Uncle Jesse, and I'm not sure how I should take that. Uh, Kenzie earned her BFA in acting from Rutgers, and during college she spent a year working and training in Shakespeare's Globe Theater, where her favorite plays were Richard III, Macbeth, and Midsummer Night's Dream. Pretty uh, heavy choices there. Kenzie originally hails from Akron, Ohio, and she unfortunately suffered a lot of abuse during the most recent NBA finals at the hands of some Golden State fans. But speaking for myself, I'm glad that she has brought her talents to our office. Uh, Jay Kaplan attends Anton Scalia Law School at George Mason University, where he's a rising 2L. Uh, prior to going to law school, Jay worked as a big data analyst for U.S. News and World Report, and he was a professional poker player. In preparing for today's meeting, we tried to look at some of the records uh, that he held in poker tournaments. We couldn't find much because the commission's filtering software blocked us from accessing any single page we would try to, to find with that information. But nevertheless, given his experience, which I'm sure is weighty, there has to be a few WSOP bracelets under those sh uh, short sleeves. Uh, we are probably going to deploy Jay as our office's chief negotiator in the next couple of months. Jay graduated from Emory in Atlanta as a native of the D.C. region. He's a huge sports fan, uh, baseball, b football, and basketball. He roots for the home teams in the latter two sports, but for some reason de defies both explanation and justice. He's a Yankees fan. Uh, Jay lives here, here. with his wife. <laughs> well, we all can't be perfect, of course. Right. Um, uh, Jay lives with his wife in Arlington, and if all goes well, they will celebrate their first anniversary next week. So welcome <laughs> aboard, Jay. And... Don't screw it up over the next couple of days. 
Uh, two administrative notes as well. Uh, this is Pride Month, and so I want to extend a happy Pride Month to the FCC's LGBT employees. Uh, we are happy uh, to work alongside you, and uh, we uh, hope you have a wonderful month. And, uh, uh, and as well, for the disability community, I had the privilege of uh, a couple of weeks ago announcing the Chairman's Awards for Advancement in Accessibility. And this is something that if you haven't had a chance to do, I really urge you to just Google it and take a look at some of the innovations that are happening all across this country. One of the things we always talk about the agency, as Commissioner Clyburn noted with uh, one of her law clerks, is uh, digital inclusion. And for a great many ma Americans who are blind or deaf or hard of hearing, those communications technologies that we take for granted are sometimes not accessible. Well, there's a whole slew of innovators out there who are looking to bridge that gap. And I had a chance a couple of weeks ago to recognize some of them in a public forum and congratulate them for the work that they do. And so I was really grateful to uh, all of these companies, all of these entrepreneurs, all of the folks from the disability community who came together to recognize that uh, we are slowly but surely getting to the point where everyone in the United States has the ability to take advantage of these technologies. Uh, that is all for me. Uh, if uh, no one else has any more announcements, we will turn to the Madam Secretary for uh, the date of the next public meeting of the FCC. The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Thursday, July 13th, 2017. That's we are adjourned. Um, we're about to begin the press conference, so if you'd like to take your seats and if any uh, take any conversations outside, please. Uh, Chairman Pye. All right. Thank you, Mark. Hey, everybody. Uh, 83 years ago this Tuesday, the Communications Act was signed into law, which, as you know, means that the FCC shares a birthday with uh, singer Paula Abdul and the rapper Macklemore. Uh, one of the core duties that Congress assigned to the FCC in 1934 was promoting safety of life and property through the use of wire and radio communications. And moments ago, the FCC paid a birthday tribute to our founders by acting on that very charge. A capping Public Safety Month of the Commission, we just adopted three items that aim to harness the power of uh, communications to enhance the safety of the American people and to the first responders who serve and protect us. Uh, first, we advanced plans to authorize a new emergency alert system code for imminent threats against law enforcement. Uh, this is an important step toward establishing a nationwide blue alert system. These alerts can warn the public when there's actionable information relating to a law enforcement officer who's been attacked or is under threat, giving citizens instructions on how they can stay safe or even supply information proactively to authorities. A second, we moved one step closer to making a nationwide interoperable public safety broadband network a reality. We adopted procedures and standards that we'll use to assess whether any state that seeks to exercise its authority to build its own public safety network will be able to make that network interoperable with FirstNet. And third, in response to issues raised by a recent spike in calls targeting schools and religious organizations, we propose to change our rules to ensure that all threatened parties and associated law enforcement personnel have quick access to the information they need to identify and thwart threatening callers. I'm pleased that the FCC was able to act unanimously to take these uh, important steps to honor our public safety commitments. And I also want to briefly highlight the notice of apparent liability that we adopted today. We couldn't publicize it before the meeting for law enforcement reasons, but this is a really important matter. Spoofed robocalls are a growing problem, and I hear complaints about them all the time, including uh, just a couple of days ago at this week's Senate appropriations hearing from Senator Coons. Our aggressive action today, the very first of its kind, sends a very clear message to those who are engaging in this illegal conduct. The FCC takes this problem seriously and is willing to devote the resources necessary to investigate and, if necessary, prosecute spoofing operations that harm American consumers. Uh, it's been a busy time here at the FCC, and uh, that time uh, doesn't stop with uh, this uh, meeting. Today is white copy day for the July uh, meeting, as you know, and you'll soon see, soon see this afternoon at some point that we have an equally packed agenda scheduled for next month. So while our summer vacations will have to wait, uh, I guess your, uh, your question certainly will not. And so with that, I guess I would open the floor uh, to uh, folks who would like to ask anything. Monty, why don't you go ahead? Uh, yeah, Monty Taylor, Com Daily. Hi. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, additional security visible at this meeting, and we're also we've got these nifty orange badges today. And I noticed also that you guys were all filed out in a big group. Uh, is that a response to something in particular? Is no, that a change in policy? 
Oh, for example, the orange badges, we wanted to speed your ability to get into uh, the FCC building and to make sure that uh, you were able to get to uh, the, the area that's set aside for press and make sure you're able to ask the questions. So uh, we're just trying to take steps to make things uh, smoother uh, for you. So that is, it's not a response to the Alexandria shooting or to the security incident at the May meeting or anything like that? Well, as I said, some of these measures, uh, we just want to, we get input uh, from folks and we want to make sure that we take the steps that are necessary to make it easier uh, for you to do your jobs. Okay. Thank you. Kyle Daly, Bloomberg BNA. Thank um, you. Hey. So uh, President Trump last night uh, recommitted to making broadband part of the infrastructure package. I was just wondering, A, have you spoken with the White House about that? And, and B, can you talk at all about how big you think the FCC's role should be? I know the idea has been raised, for instance, of channeling most, if not all, uh, broadband infrastructure funding through existing USF programs. Sure, and I don't know if you had a chance to see it. We put out this morning a formal statement on this issue, and uh, I'm really excited about what it co could portend uh, for unserved Americans who are on the wrong side of the digital divide. Uh, a few months ago in Pittsburgh, I outlined my vision uh, for a national infrastructure plan, and I said that to the extent that that plan was uh, being considered, I would hope that it would include uh, resources devoted to digital infrastructure, to broadband and other uh, next-generation technologies. And to me, this is one of the critical uh, factors in terms of making all Americans uh, more productive, happier, and more likely to thrive is uh, giving them Internet access. And that's something I've seen in my own travels uh, in places like Medelia, Minnesota, and Spencer, Iowa, and Mission, South Dakota, and even Casper, Wyoming, just uh, uh, last week, that there are a lot of Americans who are on the wrong side of the divide. And I think the President's announcement and uh, the willingness of many other agencies on the federal level to work together, as we saw last week at the Department of Agriculture, um, I think could go a long way uh, towards solving that problem. So I'm excited, and I hope that uh, working in a bipartisan spirit, we'll be able to um, uh, collaborate on these issues. And related to that, I would add also that as Senator Coons, as you might have noticed, uh, co-sponsored Senator Capito's Gigabit Opportunities, or GO Act. And uh, this is a tremendous uh, accomplishment, I think, that it heralds that there uh, is a bipartisan uh, commitment to providing Internet access to unserved Americans. And I hope that that legislation and uh, any other legislative ideas that folks might come up with will be embraced in that spirit of uh, collaboration. Lydia? Hi. Hi. Lydia Bayou, Event Driven News. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Yesterday, you received a letter from Senator Thune asking you to start a proceeding on mid-band spectrum. This morning, uh, the president received a drone demonstration. Uh, some people think that drones might use mid-band spectrum. So in light of that and other industry interests, do you have plans to act on those requests, and what might your timing be? We will take a look at the senator's letter and uh, at any other uh, related correspondence from folks who might be interested. And uh, we don't have uh, any specific plans at this point, but we're studying the issue, of course, and uh, we'll take the appropriate action in due course. Margaret? Hey, Margaret McGill with Politico. Hello. Um, hi. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about your role at the White House meeting this morning and kind of a related question to that. I know there have been concerns before about um, the independence of the agency and working with the White House. So if you could balance, talk about balancing agency independence with discussing um, potential policy initiatives at the White House. Sure. We had a, an excellent conversation this morning with a variety of uh, tech and telecom uh, leaders. And uh, the focus of the group that I was invited to participate in was on 5G and the Internet of Things. And uh, there, of course, the FCC does have um, a great interest in some of the building blocks of those networks of the future, uh, spectrum and infrastructure and the like. So it was a very fruitful conversation and uh, look forward to working with all interested parties uh, on making sure the United States uh, retains and extends its leadership role in, uh, in wireless innovation. And with respect to independence, uh, I've consistently said that we are an independent agency here at the FCC. Um, and there are ways that we can collaborate with others uh, to make sure that we're all steering in the right direction. Uh, just last week, for instance, at the Department of Agriculture, uh, Secretary Purdue led a group of leaders from the FCC, from a variety of cabinet agencies, uh, to figure out how, what can we do to boost rural prosperity. And to me, at least, uh, we are all sort of sailors uh, with oars in the same boat, trying to steer in the right direction. And so to me, uh, it's an all-hands-on-deck effort to make sure that rural Americans in that case and uh, wireless innovators in today's case uh, have the tools that they need to benefit the American people. Lynn? Hi. Hi, Lynn Stanton, Tierra Daily. Uh, regarding the multiple tenant and 
the MTE um, yeah. <laughs> item. Can you just say moving on up item? Yes, moving on. The, the, the friends and perfect strangers item. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Riley mentioned or said that uh, Title I reclassification of broadband could sort of make the entire conversation in this NOI moot. Do uh, you have any thoughts as to, you know, why are you, st- if that's the case, why are you starting this since you seem to be headed down the Title I direction? Well, this is one of the issues that we tee up for public comment in the item, and uh, I look forward to seeing where the record develops on that point and others uh, going forward. Um, so you don't... Do you, well, no, that's, that's exactly the reason why. Is that a good use of agency resources if you think you're going in one direction that kind of moots an entire another project that you're doing? Uh, again, this is the reason why we're having the conversation. That's why we teed it up. And so, again, we'll see what folks say uh, on that point and uh, make the appropriate judgment. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, Mr. Chairman. Todd Shields, Bloomberg News. Is Ringless voicemail dead? Will you guys deny that? They, The people behind it put in a request uh, two days ago to say, please withdraw the petition. Is, will you now rule uh, that Ringless, what, what's going to happen with that item? Uh, We'll take a look. Uh, Obviously, uh, I recently learned uh, about the withdrawal of that petition, and uh, we'll, again, here too, uh, we'll follow the appropriate course in consultation with uh, the FCC staff handling that issue. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Matt Daneman with Communications Daily. Beyond the Part 2 and 25 uh, rules updates on NGSOs, I'm wondering if you've had any conversations with the Bureau, any thoughts on broader regulatory changes for satellite. You've got not only the NGSO boom, but other nations that are creating sort of regulatory regimes to be attractive to emerging space technologies. I'm wondering where you see the FCC going in terms of possible regulatory reform for, for satellite in the future. I can't give you any specifics. I would certainly defer to uh, the uh, very knowledgeable staff of the International Bureau and OET and WTB and others uh, for some of the particulars. But I will say conceptually, our aim here is to ensure that the United States uh, leads the world in terms of satellite innovation. And uh, that's important not just for the sake of claiming the mantle, but also because this kind of innovation has particular promise, as I pointed out in my statement, uh, for some of the rural and remote and tribal and other areas in the United States that are harder to serve. And so there are innovative new ideas about how to put a satellite spectrum to use for the benefit of these and other American consumers. Uh, we want to make sure that the FCC is acting proactively uh, to give those uh, technologies a chance to uh, be experimented with and hopefully to bloom in uh, the broadband marketplace. Table? Hi. Hi. No worries. I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, Yeah, you mentioned rocket fiber specifically saying, um, you know, it's always good for us to open up competition. Um, I wonder how you feel about um, federal funds that uh, President Trump uh, announced would go toward uh, rural broadband, some of those funds going toward cooperatives, local cooperatives and municipal projects. that what you, do you think that would be a, a good way to boost competition more? Well, I certainly think uh, when it comes to federal funds, uh, that is a determination for the White House and Congress to make. Obviously, uh, depending on how they structure the infrastructure plan, uh, we, we will dutifully administer it. What I have said is that my hope is that uh, any funding along those lines would be channeled through the FCC's existing uh, mechanisms. Uh, they have done a, a pretty good job over the years of distributing this funding. And over the last several months, we tried to institute measures to promote fiscal responsibility and accountability. Uh, fiscal responsibility in the sense that we want to get the most bang for the buck uh, in terms of reverse auctions and the like, and accountability, uh, setting forth uh, build-out requirements uh, with uh, reporting uh, measures and the like to make sure that the American taxpayer knows that these dollars uh, to whoever they go to are being devoted uh, to the build-out of the network. So uh, again, we look forward to working with our elected uh, counterparts, and uh, hopefully we can uh, make a dent in the digital divide in this regard in the future. Hey, John Hendel with Politico. Yeah. Uh, just wanted to ask about Lifeline a little bit, because I know that came up with the appropriators this week, where Senator Langford was asking about kind of the timeline, and you kind of suggested in a few months there might be some sort of movement there, and wondered kind of over the next few months, what are the steps you're going to be taking to, to get there? 
I can't give any particular updates on that beyond what I said uh, to the senator during the hearing, but uh, we're going to look forward to working with him and obviously with the, the, my colleagues here at the commission to see if there are steps that we can take uh, to ensure uh, that the program is uh, you, uh, on a sound footing uh, going forward and delivers value uh, for American consumers and taxpayers. But we don't have any particular steps or uh, spe specific time frames in mind in that regard. Chairman Pai Harper Nidig from the Hill. Um, I just wanted to ask if the Title II proceeding came up during your meeting at the White House this morning. I did not. I think that's it. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Have a good summer. <laughs>
to my knowledge, I think they were mostly clarifications of some of the conditions based on some comments that were received. So is that correct? Is that correct? Okay. So okay. no, no, not major. Thank you. Beyond the Part 2 and 25 rules review that's going on now, where, what does the, I guess sort of an echoing of what I asked the, the chairman, what does the IBC in terms of needing uh, regulatory changes in order to meet the, the NGSO, swarms of NGSOs that are, that are coming through the regulatory pipeline right now? Okay. Well, I think we see our role as promoting the environment for all satellite services to help close the digital divide. Um, we're very proud of our U.S. space industry, satellite communications sector. We're global leaders. We want to retain that ability. So we want to provide the right conditions, and we'll look to our rules and any petitions filed before us in order to make that happen. Um, there's nothing specific that I can point to other than we're clearly looking forward to these applications and the processing round to advance this, move this forward. Um, I do want to note this is a market access application that we're dealing with. We're acting on it very quickly, and as a global regulator, we want to send the signal to others around the world who might not act as quickly for U.S.-based um, services that this is a sign that we should be moving forward. The 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 very uh, review of these NGSO constellations, how challenging or how different is it regulatorily than it is from traditional GSO applications? Can you, can you give a little color on how that is affecting IB and its, its, its role and its job? Uh, I am not a rocket scientist, but in dealing with what's come before us, uh, which is rocket science, um, it is pretty significant challenges. And I'm going to let our engineer, uh, Jose Albuquerque, help address this, who can go through what makes this a little bit different and nuanced from other types of applications that we ordinarily deal with. Jose? Well, yes, certainly they are more complex and uh, there's a lot of work involved. I mean, typically we are spending a lot more time working on these applications than would be a, a regular GSO application. Even uh, more complex GSO applications like Recently, we have this multi-beam satellites. Uh, still, uh, the non-GSO applications are, are much more uh, time uh, uh, more intensive. Uh, if I may, Tom, with respect to your previous questions, I don't know exactly where we're addressing only uh, uh, non-GSO providing broadband. Because one area that uh, we've been working uh, very much lately is on uh, a possible uh, regulatory uh, framework for dealing with uh, small sites. As you know, today small satellites are increasing in number uh, dramatically. Most of them today are being authorized as experimental license in the Part 5. And uh, we've been working on uh, trying to carve uh, a, a sub, uh, some simpler rules than the typical Part 25 rules to address some uh, applications that don't really fall into the experimental uh, uh, license uh, framework. So that's one thing that we are doing, not uh, directly related to broadband, but to attend a, a demand that. Uh, is uh, growing very much. And, it, and it's another area that is consuming a, a lot of, uh, of uh, resource because uh, the number of uh, applications is, has been growing significantly. Do, do you have a sense of timing of anything regarding uh, CubeSats? It's still under evaluation by us, so we don't have a specific sense of timing. I know our staff is actively looking at those issues and, and working on them. Yeah, go one more thing. Just to clarify your remarks about sending a signal, um, are you suggesting that you want other countries or other regulators to give her some sort of reciprocity for U.S.-based satellite operators? And if that's the case, who are you referring to? Um, I'm not making any specific reference to other countries, although I do want to hail that we act quickly on our applications uh, here in the U.S. and hope that others who are addressing satellite licensing in their countries 
also can provide those quick authorizations so their consumers can also benefit from these types of services. Thank you very much. Um, are there questions for the wireline bureau next? Um, either multi-tenant uh, environments or um, payphones. Okay. Uh, and then finally, the last item would be the enforcement bureau item, uh, robocalls. Uh, Lynn so has a question on that. Hi. Hi. During the presentation, there was a mention of the, all these calls being dangerous and um, creating some kind of burden or risk for the communications network. Did that go beyond just the medical paging um, incident that was mentioned specifically, or was that the, the entirety of that particular concern? Did you want to? Um, oh, sure. Christy will speak to some of the specific threats that we heard about. Sure. No, I, I got the question. Um, there was one specific. The, the specific instance that we were referring to was the medical paging network. Um, however, we note in the NAL that um, unlawful mass robocalling campaigns like this one create a burden on phone networks generally, uh, which has a wider effect than any one particular network and can cause harms. More general, I guess, than the specific um, alleged perpetrator. Uh, do the way they do this, this neighbor calling with the the area codes and the exchange, do they? Is it that they're pushing them all out at once, so that like every all the the central office or whatever the modern day equivalent of the central office is is getting overburdened because they? Or, or I was picturing it. You know, they've got a number that comes up and they just replicate some number that's similar, but they're not necessarily mass calling at any one time in a particular exchange, if that makes sense. Uh, so it's, it's very sophisticated. It's all done through computer software programs. And each call, uh, the, millions of calls go out at the exact minute and even second at the same time, or, or they're, they're capable of, of doing that. Um, and what the records show is that tens of thousands of calls would all happen, or hundreds of thousands of calls would all happen within the same, you know, one minute period, um, because everything is generated, com you know, by a computer uh, program. And what the algorithm does is it, it uh, grabs the first six digits of the recipient's number, then mirrors that in the caller ID, and then selects four random digits at the end to insert into caller ID. So it's not uh, a matter of birth any particular exchange at all. The calls are generated from from um, locations that could be, you know, thousands of miles away from the local exchange whose number is being spoofed. Um, it, it's just inserted solely as a way of, of hiding the true origin of the traffic. Thank you. So in, in this case, where were the computers that were generating the calls? Uh, we'd like to keep that confidential because that's a continuing part of our enforcement investigation. Say, so were they in the U.S. or abroad or outside the U.S.? They're, yeah, they're located in the United States. In the United States, okay. And uh, if we could, uh, an FCC 101 or maybe 201 uh, piece of information. It's a proposed uh, 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 proposed fine now. What's the path ahead? What's the procedure? When does it, and then maybe someday become an actual fine as opposed to proposed? What, what do we mean by proposed? Yeah, so the the procedure, you know, this is a part of the due process uh, for the, the target of this investigation. We propose these fines. The, the uh, target, who in this case is Mr. Adrian Abramovich, has 30 days after uh, the NAL is issued to respond. We then consider his response. He, he, can, uh, the, he can make a number of um, pleadings within that that are, that are spelled out in the statute. Uh, proposing either cancellation or reduction of the fine, and he must make those showings in his response. We will then consider those arguments in due course, and the next procedural step 
uh, one of two things happens in an NAL generally. Either um, we, we can propose a reduction or cancellation of the penalty uh, or, a, or not find his arguments uh, credible, if, you know, depending on what, what um, the response is, and go straight to a, a forfeiture order imposing some or all of the proposed penalty. Uh, this would be a commission level item, so this would come out of the, the commission. Because it's over a certain threshold? Correct. Okay. Um, Follow up question. I guess this is probably the first one I remember seeing against someone who's not a, um, regulated by the commission. And you mentioned that there was some kind of notice issued earlier in the day to, to Mr. Romulitz. Is that the only sort of extra step you have to take in terms of it being someone who's not a licensee or otherwise regulated? Uh, so in this case, the, the two parts of the statute apply differently. The truth and caller oh, – sorry, let me back up. The, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act and the, uh, and the wire fraud uh, enforcement are subject to Section 503's requirement that before a notice of apparent liability is issued, the recipient must first receive a citation warning them of the, of the conduct and the consequences for continued violation. Um, but when Congress passed the Truth and Caller ID Act of 2009, they specifically exempted that section of Section 503 uh, that requires us to send a citation before we can propose forfeitures, which is why uh, Mr. Abramovich did not receive a citation about spoofing um, before we issued the NAL directly. And that is the most communications nerd answer I think I've ever, <laughs> I've ever given. I have a question. Um, during, I'm Edward Graham from Morning Consult. Um, Chairman Pai said that this is the first time the FCC has taken action against the spoofing operation under the Truth and Caller ID Act. Um, is this going to be a trend moving forward? Um, this is an area that, um, you know, we have been looking into for some time. And, um, you know, if there are folks out there that are violating our rules and uh, violating the law, we're going to look to bring the full force of the Bureau down upon them. So I would say stay tuned. Thank you. Anything further? Okay, thank you. And Commissioner O'Reilly is here now uh, to take your questions. He's trying to warm up. Stayed. Whoa. Howdy, howdy. We'll start this way and work, or how do you want to? Oh, we'll do, do whatever you would like. I got nothing, so far. nothing. Who's got a question? I got one. All right, go ahead. Um, it's good because it segues from the enforcement discussion we were just having. Um, you made a distinction between the intent to defraud and the intent to harm in your concurrence. Um, and if you could elaborate, I mean, are, it sounds like you're saying that because his intent was what to, to benefit himself rather than to harm someone else, it's... Well, and I, th I think it'd be, uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself. You'll, it'd be helpful when you get the chance to read the, the item itself because it will, because it goes into some of that. Um, and I think that provides more color to my statement. I don't want to get too far advanced because the document's not out. I'm allowed to say certain things as part of the meeting, but I want to be careful uh, given especially the sensitivity of an enforcement item. But I do, um, I, I, I just, um, I concurred in the item, so I think that they were, you know, generally heading in the right direction. I just thought there were some points we should have had more precise approach. We suggested going to an intent to defraud, which is part of our rules, and we could have, they, they seem focused on the intent to harm and the multiple parties that were, that are, um, are included in that, that universe of harm, I say it that way. Would you consider dissenting from the final order then if, if these issues aren't addressed? Well, or? there's a lot of steps as the, as the Bureau just went through in terms of, yeah. you know, where the NAL goes in terms of the responses from Mr. Bramovich if, if he chooses to respond and then going to a forfeiture item at some point if that's the case. So we're premature at this point. I just I, I think there was an opportunity to be more precise. I think there were some, certainly in the presentation, I, you know, there's just, there's wordings that, that, that really matter, you know, you can't, I don't think you should call it spam. You know, I, there's there's a reason we have you know spams over here. It's got a statute that governs spam. So I just I wanted some more precision, and I thought there was this is one the one case in terms of the intent to harm. Thank you, uh, Commissioner O'Reilly. As you know, the FCC received several petitions this week from the wireless industry asking for changes to the citizens broadband radio service, the sharing paradigm. Um, what 
are you, can you provide some insight into your thoughts on revisiting that framework? And if so, how soon you'd like to see those petitions resolved and in what structure like an FNPRM or wrapped into something else? So it's my understanding we put the petitions out this morning for comment. So people have an opportunity to comment on those. I, you know, it is my goal to provide a recommendation uh, to the chairman as best I can as, as soon as possible. I'd like to be able to do that, you know, this fall. Um, I'd like to wrap the whole thing up by the end of the year. I don't, that's my goal. Um, but depending, you know, a lot of different, you know, depending on how the comments come in and how the process works, it's, it's will. But I've articulated my views on, the, on, on, on what I want to do in this space, at least my, my initial views. I'll see if the record changes them. But I certainly want to see the PALs uh, be effective and be useful to those that may seek them. I don't think that that was done, and I made those points as part of the 3.5 item previous, and I want to see us correct those, and I think there's general agreement amongst uh, everyone, including the you know, the unlicensed community that have no difficulty with PALs being actually effective. Um, to be a three-tiered structure, you actually all three tiers should work, and so that's what I'm trying to accomplish. Commissioner, during the one web, uh, your, your, your concurrence in the one web, you said that it raises questions about issues like in inline interference and about orbital debris. Are the answers to those contained within existing FCC regulatory structure, or do these issues need to be addressed by rules changes? They are. Um, there's probably a little bit of both. There's probably some that we have. You know, I think there's more that needs to be done on debris, um, certainly, and, and I think that that's a global conversation. Um, but I think there's some that, w that we can do and, and some we have to do in, in partnership. And so we have to work through those satellites, obviously not uh, completely domestic uh, offering. So the, the, there is an international component to that. Um, and I'll certainly be talking to all those folks as I head to CTEL uh, going this weekend. I was wondering, uh, there's bipartisan legislation on uh, asking the FCC to uh, create a methodology for uh, standardizing the maps, the production of maps to represent broadband coverage. Um, I wonder if you'd comment on where the commission is uh, looking at that. So I, I don't have great information in terms of where, where, what the stage is at the commission in terms of legislation that's for Congress to, to decide. Do I think that we can improve our 477 uh, data, both collection in terms of, and, and you know, um, a map is only so important. It's really does the does the data help get you to determine who is covered and who is not covered? Um, Mapping is a visual impact of the data. So uh, people talk about a national broadband map, and I, it, it's helpful to some degree. But it really matters what uh, what does it matter for our purposes of trying to determine our subsidies? Uh, I think we've done a, a fairly good job, and I think they definitely can be improved and made more precise. Uh, they, it does make it harder um, for folks that have been working on this. It does get really hard to, to get more precise, but I think that's part of our, our, our due diligence to make sure our dollars are spent very wisely. And so I'm supportive of that effort and want we'll to see where how exactly it goes. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Okay. Hey, thank you. Margaret McGill with Politico. I was looking at your testimony uh, from this week's hearing, and you mentioned some problems at USAC. I'm wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on what sh what's going on there and kind of what changes you'd like to see. Well, I, uh, there are a number of problems. I think there are a number of issues. I've had difficulty in just um, getting answers and um, in terms of who's responsible for certain things. Um, I think that the uh, appointment of a new uh, ha acting head has been somewhat helpful to that process, and th that's that's a good step. The chairman has obviously focused very closely on no some particulars um, of, of the more specifics, but in the, the macro sense, I think that you know we we talk about e-rate reform. Um, I, I there's no doubt that many people have heard that the computer system is in a, in a pretty precarious situation. I think that's problematic. Um, to your to your last point, you know what I think I want to do about it. I am, have advocated and, and I'm trying to figure out how best to go about uh, making a more formal presentation to uh, put the entire uh, offering out for bid. We kind of had this USAC structure that's like a nonprofit, quasi-governmental agency that, that kind of is like a it's an offshoot of us where they just basically take the, the costs off the top. Um, but they're not responsible necessarily to us, but they are, it is very unclear on those lines of communication and those lines of authority. 
Um, it's in lines of responsibility. Um, and so I, I would I recommend and, and try to figure out how best to go about it. But we should put the contract out for bid and find a different party. Maybe they, they win the bid, but I think we should we do this in a number of fronts. We've done a numbering, very complex situation, but we've done a numbering. I certainly think we can do it here um, and should be explored fuller than uh, than just uh, you know replacing the CEO. Uh, yes, sir. I'll go. Hi, Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, yes, sir. What's ahead? What's ahead for the UHF uh, discount? The, not the court's done its stay. What are you guys going to do here? And what, what, what's going to happen with ownership rules? So I, I think the UHF discount without the stay is where I thought it was going to be. Um, it, I support uh, reinstating the UHF discount. I think it was in our, it, you know, to me it was just complying with the law. So I don't think we had the, I don't think we had the authority to change it. Um, and I've previously articulated and continue my views that we don't have the authority to change the national ownership cap, and, but I think the chairman wants to explore that, and I said I'll let it be litigated out as we, as we go forward. So I think the two are not only tied, but I think they're prohibited from changing, um, and we'll just see if, if my position holds out uh, going forward. Um, I, I, I'm kind of interested to see myself. I, I have vivid memories of the, of the conversations uh, that, that, that helped shape those, the, that policy, um, and I'm um, interested to see how it plays out. But, you know, Intellectually or philosophically, I don't, you know, support the. You know, I think that the changes to the national ownership cap are definitely, uh, um, definitely um, would be helpful and necessary. I don't think they reflect. I don't think 39% reflects the current marketplace in, in a reality. I, it never was it, at the time. It was a, it was a, it was a political decision, um, which Congress gets to make. Um, but uh, I, I don't think 39% makes a, makes a lot of sense in, in today's uh, today's environment. FCC to consider and finish uh, its work on a Tribune Sinclair merger with all these limits in flux. So I never talk about uh, any uh, particular application pending um, or any kind of merger situation. I just kind of keep out of that best I can. Fellow can try. <laughs> yes, sir. Just up on Todd just asked. Uh, sure. Do you have any idea about when that national cap oh. discussion is going to happen? Yeah, my apologies. I didn't answer your second part, uh, and that's what Monty just followed up on. Um, I don't have a, a – I, I, just from my previous comments from the chairman, I think he said by the, you know sometime this year, later this year, I think is what he previously indicated. I, I don't have any better timing from you. Yes, sir. Um, so also following up on Todd's yeah. question, when you talk about getting those issues litigated out, are you speaking figuratively in terms of over the course of the rulemaking? No, I think they're going to be litigated process? out, right? We're going to right, but that would mean you'd have to, even if you don't believe that you have the authority, you, you, presumably Commissioner Clyburn isn't going to vote uh, to support changing well, the cap. So you would have to. You've got a ton of hypotheticals uh, in your in your question. <laughs> I don't know the. Um, th that that's fair, but I also but it goes back to to maybe Monty's question, which goes back to. To this question, which is the timing, I don't know the timing of the project, and, and therefore I don't know the makeup of the commission. Uh, you know, if, if it's six months, months from now, that could be a different commission. I don't know, so I don't, I don't uh, want to speak about how how what the makeup may be. But look, at I've, I've I've had my views. I've said that it be litigated out, and we'll go from there. Yes, sir. Not following up from Todd's question, okay. uh, ATVA has uh, been making noise about the record number of blackouts that are going on this this calendar year thus far. Does the FCC have any role to play in, in regulatorily in retransmission disputes? There is. It's a. It, I've said before. I think the, the authority is very is fairly narrow. Um, we certainly have great concern for consumers that are disrupted and want to provide as much relief as possible, but I don't think the statute provides a great role. Um, I, I think we want to see resolution to those issues as soon as, you know, as quickly as possible and uh, and, and as, 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 as fruitful as possible. Uh, but there is not a huge uh, f statutory role for the commission in, in terms of that. Well, I think we're that 
jumps a couple of leaves because I think as, as I remember it's an NOI. So before we even get to an NPRM, you know, so like we got a couple of leaps before we get to the final rules, and we just I think we're in the process of collecting comments, and we'll see or starting to collect comments, and we'll just see what you know how it firms up to an NPRM if if so, and then where it goes from there. So I think it's probably a little premature, but you know I, I I've articulated my thoughts on marketing, for instance. They don't. My views don't tend to change. I'm open to see if the record does change my mind, and I, I, I fully said that I'm waiting to be convinced, and, and, and we'll read the record to, to on any topic to be convinced otherwise. But I don't, you know, the statute being as the statute is, I don't believe we have some some things. I I think I said it. I, I don't know about problems, but I think I said I just said some wonders about some of the, you know, I, uh, softly raised some issues uh, regarding the item, and we'll just see where it goes. Thank you. Of course. You've spoken this week about spectrum sharing and the 5.9 gigahertz band. Can you? Sorry, you got some reverberations there. You, you've spoken earlier this week about spectrum sharing and the 5.9 band. Yes. And uh, you've been a big advocate of sharing so long as it's safe. Can you update us a little bit on where the FCC stands right now with um, sure. testing those devices sure. and what do you view as the path forward here? Well, we're still in the testing phase and hopefully we'll have uh, conclusions and then go to field testing. But uh, and I don't have any uh, definitive word to give you in terms of the you know how how uh, how that testing has progressed. I think we're st- sorry. Uh, so, um, but I, I'm, I'm still optimistic that the testing will prove that sharing can be permitted. It is obviously the most likely and most reasonable band to extend the benefits of Wi-Fi. Um, given their proximity to the to neighboring bands and the the issues um, that that we've had with the DSRC um, and its timing, I certainly hope the DSRC is successful at some point. I, that, I leave that to the to the auto manufacturers and others. But um, in the meantime, I think that I believe that we can do sharing here. We're obviously doing sharing at 3.5 between government, military, DoD, radar. Uh, and, and GAA on license use. So I think that if we can accomplish it there, I do believe we can do it in 5.9. I think it's the most appropriate band uh, given where we are today. We obviously have some high band spectrum that we're, we're, we've allocated and additional high band spectrum that we're, alloc- that we're exploring as part of Spectrum Frontiers in the 70 gigahertz and 80 gigahertz. But I think 5.9 is something that there's been great support for in terms of an unlicensed uh, allocation uh, and and hopefully we'll be able to the data will prove that case. Well, let me follow up on the chairman. Um, with regard to Senator Thune's letter to the FCC yesterday about uh, starting an NPRM on midband spectrum sharing, um, what are your thoughts on that request and and what would you like to see happen there? Yeah, I don't want to get ahead of the chairman. He's, he he gets to determine the items that the commission. Con- considers, um, I'm very supportive of moving forward on something in the, the 3.7 to 4.2 and the 6 gigahertz bands. I think that I'm actually working on a blog on this point, um, and I've met with the industry on this issue. I think there's a win-win-win to be had here. Um, not only do you can you make more spectrum available for license purposes, not only can you make spectrum available for unlicensed purposes, but you can also uh, you know protect those or reallocate those or move those if necessary to make sure that the incumbents are taken care of, depending on those that are in the band. It's not just yanking their licenses and trying to figure out how best to go, you know, working with everybody. So I think there's a win to be had here, and I'm very supportive of that, um, and, and we'll be articulating that uh, depending on how fast I get to my, you know, can finish my blog. Uh, but but I, I, you know, I think it complements uh, Senator Thune's letter. Uh, to, to where they're going, they identified bands in mobile now and bands that they want the commission to look at. I think our job is the, the, the duty to figure and, and the, the hard lift of, you know, figuring out how best to deal with the incumbents that are there, um, and then also figuring out the reallocation. Are there other bands you'd want to see added to that effort in addition to 3.7 to 4.2 and 6 gigahertz? I think that's where I'd start, but there are definitely others that are being looked at. And I think that's part of. Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but uh, that's it. All right. Any more questions from anybody here that might have a question for me from the press department? All right. I'm going to exit at this point. All right. Thanks, everyone, for their time. It's good to see you all.